to begin with, uh, it began around 1980, and 1987. The year was 1987. The chair of the Department of Surgery was Bill Collins. Uh, he had offered me the chiefship of the section of urology. The problem was that the chief of staff representing the hospital was dragging his feet. He specifically did not want a surgeon scientist with an RO1 to be the chief of urology. It was only after one of our faculty, Dave Green, went in and told him that I had one of the larger practices on the full-time faculty that he capitulated. Times change, perceptions change. When Dean Brown announced the search for the last chair, the first thing she said to us was, the next chair of urology will be a surgeon scientist. Peter Shulam had built, as you heard, a clinical powerhouse extending from Greenwich to Rhode Island. Now Isaac Kim is arranging both an academic and a clinical destination center for urology at Yale. When I thought about my contribution to today's event, I thought back at having been invited to be a visiting professor at a place because the chair of that department wanted me to tell them what it takes to make a surgeon scientist. At first I thought the topic was impossible. Then I thought and about maybe I should go back and look at the career of one surgeon scientist. Today, I will share this odyssey with you. To paraphrase Dragnet, the story that you are about to hear is true. The names have not been changed and there's no effort has been made to protect the innocent or the guilty. I have no disclosures. Uh, the keys, when I thought back, the keys to making an academic surgeon scientist include genetics, remembering what Yogi Berra said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it, serendipity, dealing with adversity is very important, focusing on a focused yet important confined area of expertise to study, picking good mentors and becoming a mentor, collaborating, fuck the 80 hour work week. <laughs> Never give up your patience. And there is a hidden key to a successful academic career, which I will defer referring to until the end of this talk. Wilbur Wright, who is credited with inventing, building, and flying the first successful airplane said, if I were giving a young man advice as to how he might succeed in life, I would say to him, pick out a good father and mother and begin life in Ohio. Well, I wasn't born in Ohio. I was born in New York City. However, my first mentor indeed was my father, David, who was a general surgeon and who served in New Guinea during World War II. When he came back from New Guinea, we ultimately moved to Forest Hills, where ultimately I attended high school. I must admit to you guys, I was not a great athlete. However, I was captain of a team, the math team. And it, as captain of the math team, on that team was Lubert Stryer, who some of you probably remember, wrote, ultimately wrote the biochemistry book that many burgeoning urologists, and I can see Dr. Kim shaking his head uh, about that, many burgeoning urologists used. I've always thought that uh, 
mathematics and neurology are very similar. In both, if you analyze a given pro problem in an organized manner, you will come to the appropriate mode of action. Uh, parenthetically, when Bernie Linton took over the section of urology, his first two recruits, myself and Marty Schiff, were both math majors in college. I went the next three years to Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was supposed to go to Columbia, except again here, my mentor, my father, laid out certain rules. I had to leave New York City. I had to go to a small school, except that it better not be co-ed. No distractions were allowed. And I, I, I went and found f and which was a small school. It was focused on science. And there I was able to be taught by lots of faculty who spent the time teaching mechanisms of reaction rather than making us memorize. I also at f and was able to interact with other young future scientists such as Stan Dudrick, who ultimately put hyperalimentation on the, on the map. During my time in college, f and required a course, which I was against, a course in public speaking. However, for a compensated introvert who was destined for a career in academics, uh, they were doing me a, a, an important favor. Adversity had, had occurred. There was a, a lighter side of, of, of f and such as acting opposite Roy Scheider of future Jaws fame. Franklin Marshall College is located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in, in the Amish country. If you asked an Amishman how you could get from one place to another, he would always say, to get to there, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, where I was going at that time, where I was going, I did not know. When will I get there? I was not certain. All I knew, I was on my way. I discontinued my studies of mathematics and entered medical school at the State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center. There, I worked in the Department of Pharmacology and in the lab of Dr. Kwang Su Lee. Dr. Lee was studying contractility of glycerin in cardiac muscle. Little did I realize that the, uh, the study of muscle would be the foundation of my future career, serendipity. Also, the chair of the Department of Pharmacology uh, was Robert Fershkot, who subsequently found the, a factor in the endothelium of blood vessels, which caused relaxation of the vessels. This turned out to be nitric oxide. Subsequently, uh, subsequently, uh, in years to come, I happened to become a PI on an NIH grant studying nitric oxide in uh, smooth muscle of, in smooth muscle and in inflammation. Not planned, but fortuitous. I then, at, in medical school, we were brainwashed, literally brainwashed, just like in Russia that we had to go into internal medicine. Uh, I thus took my internship on the Cornell Division uh, of Medicine at uh, Bellevue Hospital. There, I interacted with a very strong group of residents and fellows, including Joe Fraumini of the subsequent Lee Fraumini Syndrome, Bert Bell of the Bell Commission. Thomas Almy was the chief of the division, and he subsequently uh, became the dean at Dartmouth College Medical School, at Dartmouth Medical School. Adversity, however, was nearby. Uncle Sam wanted me. My approach was to go to the chief, the head of the New York City draft board and plead with him, please don't take me out of my residency. He would not listen. And little did he know, that in retrospect, as you will see, 
he did the best thing that could have happened to me. I was stationed at Camp Century Greenland, the city under the ice. It was a nuclear power plant located 138 miles northeast of Thule, Greenland, 50 feet under the ice cap, the Greenland ice cap, and 800 miles from the North Pole. Being drafted or forced to enlist, in retrospect, uh, gave me time to definitely decide on a career in neurology. It also increased my desirability to the top urology program since I had completed my military service at a time when others were being taken out to serve in Vietnam. Gave me time to read urology, listen to Bartok and Mahler, play chess and drink many martinis. Every morning I would wake up to save my sanity and recite Voltaire. All is the best in this best of all possible worlds. I've always considered this episode in my life to parallel the story of the Siberian sparrow, who on a beautiful winter day, left the warmth and security of his nest to fly in the Arctic air. Frozen, he fell to the snow covered ground and surely would have died if not for the chance passing of a cow that dropped a large, warm, soft cow dung on top of him. Its warmth resuscitated the sparrow who began to twitter, which drew the attention of a wandering homeless cat that delicately pulled the sparrow out of the shit and devoured him. The moral of the story is that he who shits on you is not necessarily your enemy, and he who pulls you out of the shit is not necessarily your friend. <laughs> the second part of my tour of duty was at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where I ran into another serendipitous mentor, Arthur Peck, who provided me with an important piece of insight. His insight was many leaders of urology have built their careers on becoming experts in a small circumscribed area of study, the ureta. I, at that point in time, decided on an academic career, remembering the first law of the Arctic, that only the lead dog has a changing and interesting view to the rest of the view is rather monotonous. I then accepted the invitation of Dr. John Kingsley Latimer, who is the chair of urology uh, at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. I accepted his invitation to become a resident there. Dr. Latimer was one of the leading experts in the circumscribed field of GU tuberculosis and thus, produced, uh, and thus was a serendipitous role model, but someone to emulate. That's how he made his career. In addition, he was one of the founding fathers of pediatric urology, the field of study that I would do clinically in the future. Dr. Latimer, shortly after I began my residency, he was an expert on the ballistics with John F. Kennedy assassination, and he was awarded the first NIH uh, urology training grant. Bob, you are the low man on the totem pole. You go to the lab. I pleaded with Dr. Latimer. I said, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I mean, I just spent two years of my life doing no clinical medicine. I want to be like everyone else. Dr. Latimer would accept no, would not accept no for an answer. Adversity had happened. Again, it had struck. But remember the sparrow. This had happened to be the best thing he ever did for me. And that was the best year of my training and the most important. Dealing with apparent adversity has been one of the mantras uh, of my career. As Marcus Aurelius said, our actions may be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions. The impediment to action advances action, 
what stands in the way becomes the way. Or in the words of the Carthaginian General Hannibal Barker, we will find a way or we will make one. I went to the lab, but did not follow Dr. Latimer's uh, suggestion of having a mentor, one of the urologists, but remembered my training in, in pharmacology as a medical student and went and, uh, tr to meet Dr. Brian Hoffman, who was the David Hosack Professor and Chair of Pharmacology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, for those of you who are interested in history, David Hosek is the physician who took care of Alexander Hamilton when he, <coughs> when he was shot during the duel uh, with, with Aaron Burr. In addition, uh, David Hosek owned the land, which is today Rockefeller Center in New York City, which he ultimately gave to Columbia, who made a fortune when he sold it to the city. Uh, Dr. Hoffman had been at Downstate, and thus when I walked into his office, I was not a complete uh, unknown. He knew my mentors and he respected them. When I walked into his office, I said to him that I wanted to study glycerinated ureteral smooth muscle. Dr. Hoffman had always thought, which I didn't know, that there was many similarities between heart muscle, being he was a cardiac electrophysiologist, and ureteral muscle. And thus he turned to his uh, desk of a filing cabinet as he would normally do and grunt and pulled this out. This tracing is not an EKG, which is what it looks like, but rather is a ureteral EMG that was published by Orbelian von Brück in 1910 in the German literature. Thus, began the ureteral period and a collaboration with the Department of Pharmacology that lasted over 25 years. And I ultimately became an adjunct professor of pharmacology at Columbia. And I used to lecture to the Columbia medical students on signal transduction. The ureter is, you're not gonna, it is a syncytial smooth muscle and if you Look at the electrical activity in the ureter. It progresses from up down, from approximately uh, distally. And as you see here, uh, there's a recording on top. We put multiple uh, electrodes on the, I'm not sure, that no, doesn't see that well. We put multiple uh, electrodes on the ureter by, and could measure the activity approximately then distally, approximately then distally, so on and so forth. And each of the electrical activities gave rise to the mechanical activity or contraction of the ureter, which moves the bolus of urine distally. The electrical activity uh, goes across small intermediate junctions in the ureter, which are similar to the low resistant gap junctions that are seen in the heart. Taking the fact that the heart, we thought, and the ureter were similar, a series of experiments were then done to show, using the same methodology, to show where the location of the pacemaker of the ureter is. And we used exactly the same thing, uh, instruments that were used in the 30s to localize the sinus node of the heart, and that is to use a unipolar electrode. And in the top tracing, if you put the unipolar electrode at the end of the transmission of the uh, electrical activity, you see only an upward deflection. If on the other hand, the middle one tracing, you put the electrode somewhere along the course of the transmission of the ureteral activity, it has an upward deflection and then a downward deflection. If you found the pacemaker, all the activity should go away from it. And thus you should see only a downward deflection as you see in the lower tracing. So what we did is we did the same thing in the intact dog ureter. The top tracing uh, shows the at reference electrode, which was just a bipolar electrode placed distally on the ureter. 
we took the unipolar electrode, put it proximal to it, but distal to the pelvic calicial system, nowhere near where we thought the pacemaker was. And appropriately, you see an upward deflection, then a downward deflection with the unipolar electrode. And then each wave goes distally, and you see the activity uh, in the reference electrode. If we move the unipolar electrode most proximally <coughs> to the area of the pacemaker, you would only see a downward deflection. And indeed, that's what we see, as you see there, it says pacemaker. And that it's not a artifact, you see that the, the activity goes from the top to the bottom to the reference electrode uh, with each, each move. We also showed uh, that Wankybach phenomena in the ureter, just like people find in the heart, where the, and the interval between two waves gets shorter and shorter with time until there's a drop wave. And that dis the distance of the drop is less than half of what, uh, is less than half the, dis uh, the timing of the previous one. Initially, in, for a surgeon scientist, I thought it was important to take the fork in the road that is available. As a urologist accepted into a world-class electrophysiology lab, I had to be a team player and gain from available expertise. Methodology is the most important thing that a surgeon scientist, a young surgeon scientist should learn. Uh, also, I used the, it, you had to use the available infrastructure of the lab so that you're not a financial burden to that lab. The equipment available to me included single cell intracellular recording apparatus, muscle baths for measuring contractility, acute large animal studies of the electrophysiology of the heart. And here a young surgeon was valuable and they included me on papers such as the CERC research paper that you see here. The, uh, the, the studies that I showed you on the intact ureter were done usually between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. in the morning after the cardiologists had finished their studies on the electrophysiology of the heart and before the dog was sacrificed. Although my planned studies on glycerinated ureteral smooth muscle did not pan out, I did get a nature paper on the electrical potentials of glycerinated cardiac muscle. Toward the end of my residency, I spent a day with Dr. Wyland Ledbetter at the MGH. Upon sharing with Dr. Ledbetter my plans to go into an academic career, he said, whatever you do, do not give up your patience. That is the one thing the bastards can, cannot take away from you. I never forgot that and didn't forget it during the two years that I was the interim chair of surgery here. And that put me in better position when the next chair, Rob Oodlesman, came on board. I then made a very smart decision and decided to come to Yale and with Bernie Litton. And this is the four people who we, at that point in time, many of you recognize Ed McGuire, Bernie Litton in the middle, Marty Schiff, and I'm looking from the back. We cross fertilized ideas. And by the early eighties, all four of us were full professors. This is the four of us, McGuire, Litton, Weiss, and Schiff, years later. I was very fortunate to have many collaborators in a variety of basic science uh, uh, areas of study. And collaboration is extremely important uh, for a surgeon scientist. Early on in the ureteral phase, I worked with Piero Biancani, Dr. Biancani was a biomedical engineer. And one of the things that we looked at is to determine the, uh, 
that let or explain why one sees massive dilatation of the ureter and relatively low pressures, intraluminal pressures, chronically, such as most of us know that if you see a chronic UPJ obstruction, if you put a needle in it, the pressure on those is, is relatively low. It's not that high. And so that what we did is we measured both simultaneously in a rabbit ureter pressure and diameter. We took pictures. And what you see here is at, and I think you can follow slowly, uh, at time zero is when the obstruction was done. Time is on the abscissa and the pressure is on the lower ordinate. Change in diameter or dimensions is on the upper ordinate. After the obstruction is given, the pressure starts to rise. And in turn, that reason it rises is because the urine, the kidney is still putting up urine. It gets, couldn't get beyond the point of obstruction, or if it did get beyond, it's not getting by on very easily. And thus the pressure goes up. Associated with the increase in pressure, as you would expect, there's an increase in diameter and the diameter goes up. And the reason for that is that the pressure goes up and there's an increased pressure within the system. There's some relaxation of the ureter, but the pump is still working. Then at about in a rabbit, this is a rabbit ureter, in a rabbit about three to four hours into it, the pressure starts to go down. The pump isn't working as well. The GFR goes down, you know, blood flow goes down. And although the, and also the tissue stress relaxes, also some of it may be venous, lymphat venous and lymphatic backflow, which would cause a decrease in the pressure in, in the system. However, what we noticed is <coughs> that the diameter did not go down. Uh, simultaneously. You can see that between hours four and six. And that's due to the hysteretic properties of the ure viscoelastic structure. In this, this is an isolated rabbit ureter in which we increase the pressure by raising uh, the column of fluid uh, over time. Pressure is on the ordinate dimensions or diameter, change in diameter is on the abscissa. The bigger the ureter, the further to, to the right. It goes. So if you increase the pressure, uh, the, the pressure, the, uh, if you increase the pressure, the diameter goes up. And then as you lower the pressure, diameter doesn't go down completely. And that you have larger uh, dimensions on unloading than you have on loading. And that is due to the hysteresis of, of the tissue. Then over time, uh, you can see that the pressure remains relatively stable, but the diameter goes sky high and gets big. And that's due to creep of the viscoelastic structure. And the, the, the kidney is obviously still putting out a small amount, uh, a small amount of urine. <coughs> Other studies which we had done during that time, I spent a lot of time doing intracellular recordings. And here you see some intracellular recording of a guinea pig ureter action potential and of a cat uh, action potential simultaneously with contraction. The, the problem is that these experiments took hours and hours to do, and I had to be at the bench. There was nothing else. And so thus the idea came that perhaps a more biochemical approach to the study of the ureteral smooth muscle would enable me to train others and not need to spend as much time at the bench. This uh, would facilitate me being both a surgeon and a scientist. A fork in the road had occurred. As Ralph Waldo Emerson prudently guides us, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Whereas many people on sabbatical went to exotic areas, I, I went to Nashville, Tennessee, which I assure you in the 70s was not exotic. 
I went to work with Dr. Hardman, Joel Hardman, who was the chair of pharmacology at Vanderbilt. He had taken over and was running the lab that was Earl Sutherland's. Earl Sutherland received the Nobel Prize for cyclic AMP. Joel Hardman was a biochemical pharmacologist with an interest in smooth muscle physiology. He wanted to learn more smooth muscle physiology. So when he saw that I wanted to come as a sabbatical, I was trained as a smooth muscle physiologist and was interested in learning biochemical pharmacology, a perfect marriage. Par parenthetically, uh, Dean Brown tells me that Joel Hardman's son attended her wedding. So it goes around. Uh, Joel told me that the most important thing to do in the lab in that year, six month period was to learn methodology, but we did get a paper out on isoforms of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP uh, phosphodiesterase. He also introduced me to the Gordon conferences uh, on signal transduction, where I was able annually to see the updates in the field by interacting with people such as Al Gilman, who received the Nobel Prize for G proteins, and Fred Murad, who received the Nobel Prize for nitric oxide. I subsequently created my team by recruiting Marsha Wheeler, a biochemist, and Jamshud Latifor, a receptor pharmacologist. Team science is important when, uh, team science is important in getting grants. Emetella means they got their grant. During this period, the nitric oxide period, uh, we did studies to show that the relaxation of the urethra was related to nitric oxide, the release of nitric oxide and increases in cyclic GMP. And what you see here on the top, the left experiments, uh, we, contracted the, these were ra female rabbit urethra. We contracted it with phenylephrine and alpha agonist. And then by giving very rapid, frequent, short duration pulses, we would see various uh, relaxation. Then what we did is we did the same experiment, but in the presence of NNA, which is a, a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. We blocked it. Uh, you did not, you, we used the electrical stimuli, you saw no relaxation. This in, it suggests that indeed nitric oxide is involved in the urethral relaxation. The bottom panel, the same experiment is done. The, the part on the left is exactly the same as the top. And then instead of just putting an inhibitor of, of NAS activity, we put an inhibitor plus L arginine which is the substrate for making nitric oxide. And by doing such, the relaxations occurred and recurred. There was also, if you measured cyclic GMP in the urethral tissues with the increased frequency, you see an increase in cyclic GMP levels. So that's what the suggestion is that with the electrical stimuli, we either released nitric oxide from the nerves that had the relaxation effect, or we induced nitric oxide synthase and then increased the amount of nitric oxide in the muscle by converting L-arginine uh, to nitric oxide. So nitric oxide in turn stimulated G cyclase, one oil cyclase, and we had an increase in cyclic GMP and thus relaxation of the urethra. About that time, Shannon Smith, who some of you know, uh, was a resident uh, in our department. And she said, Dr. Weiss, we're a urologist. We should study urine. Uh, for those who know, uh, Shannon's uh, husband is Victor Mar was Victor, Victor Mars, who is now the CMO at, at Bridgeport Hospital. Shannon is the first person in urology to have gotten a KO8 award from the NIH. And uh, Shannon um, succumbed to a brain tumor 
ultimately. Another fork in the road had occurred. We analyzed urine. The quintessence or fifth essence of ancient and medieval philosophy was supposed to be that substance, or perhaps if you permit me, group of substances, which lies dormant and latent in all things, and which comprises ultimately the, uh, the, the, the heavenly bodies. The extraction of that substance or group of substances was one of the main goals of alchemy. And in retrospect, in looking at the scientific progress, perhaps the alchemist should have spent a little bit more time looking at the urine. Although the symbol of the modern physician is the white coat and the stethoscope, the ancients probably had it better. They realized the importance of urine. And the symbol of the physician going back to antiquity was the half-filled urine flask. And frequently you saw the physician in a long furred robe holding proudly his half-filled urine flask. And here we see in Chaucer's can do a picture of in Chaucer's Dr. Physique uh, in his Canterbury Tales, the uh, wielding a, a loaded urinal while on horseback. In studying the urine, the ancients always put it into what was called a metula. And it's important to realize that the configuration of what they're studying it in parallels what we see in vivo, in the bladder. They thought that was a very important thing, that you should look at the urine in such a way similar to what's in the human. Uh, Hippocrates in 400 BC started to use the study of urine to determine the functions in the body. And we see this here in this 13th century manuscript of Hippocrates looking at the urine uh, while sitting at the bedside. It, Theophilus of Constantinople in 700 AD began the, uh, in his treatise of urine, began uh, the study of uroscopy. And this is seen in this 15th century uh, manuscript. This 14th century uh, medieval uroscopy chart, chart shows the urine in various gradations with the comments to the examining doctor as to what each urine meant. So if you read carefully at 12 o'clock, those urines, it says, are a golden color, perfect digestion. The four urines to the right of the midline, it says those urines have excessive digestion. The ones at seven and eight o'clock says minimal digestion, uh, digestion or nothing. And if you had urines like at five o'clock, you died. <laughs> Villanova in the 14th century at the famous medical school in Montpelier, France said, if you cannot see anything by your uroscopy, then you say it's a case of liver obstruction. But if the patient then says he's suffering from a headache, then tell him that this is due to liver disease. You should expressly use the word obstruction for that the patient does not understand. And that is very important that he does not understand what you're talking about. Peter Forrest in 1623 in his treatise of the arrangements of urine listed the many errors and abuses from ignorant uh, in, the, this, in looking at uroscopy by ignorant urine mongers, quacksayers, women physician, and like stuff. This uh, shows the uh, symbol of the uh, physician on a 16th century woodcut by Hans von Gerdstorff. This is a 17th century painting by David Teniers, the younger of the village doctor. And here we see the prosperous physician looking at the urine, whereas the peasant woman 
uh, it's frightened and it's her urine that he's looking at. This is a 17th century painting entitled Christ the Physician, which is attributed to Werner von Del Falker. Uh, and what we see here is the physician holding the urine up to examine it. The patient who is very sick is on the side. And what we see here is the physician looking like a Christ-like person. Uh, our impression to the public today uh, surely has changed. The Egyptians were very interested in determining the sex of the unborn child. And this is from a 1300 BC uh, papyrus in which they took wheat and spelt. Spelt is a heavy wheat and they put them in bags and it says, let the woman water them daily with her urine in the two bags. If they both grow, she will bear. If the wheat grows, it will be a boy. If the spelt grows, it will be a girl. If neither grows, she will not bear. This experiment was repeated in a high school class, botany class, except in Petri dishes. And as expected, it was bright in 19 out of 40 cases. <laughs> Robert Record in the 16th century wrote in his judgment of urines, if a man lets his own urine drop upon his feet in the morning, it is good against all evils. Urine is excellent fertilizer for apple trees. It improves the apple's taste. Urine is fine for treating gout and skin ailments. And urine most importantly is a diagnostic tool. Uh, it, in the 16th century, there was really very little else that a physician could do except take the pulse and look at the urine. When, when making a house call, the first thing the patient did was to show the physician the uh, chamber pot. As you see here in this drawing in 1890 of Gustav Frisson, excellent, excellent, superb. And uh, he, he's looking at the chamber pot. About that time, my great grandmother, when she started to get detrusor instability, called that a thunder mug. Uh, this 18th century painting by Gerard Du of the Dropsical Woman shows the proper way of uroscopy. The physician should hold the urine up to the light and put his fingers behind it. And if he could see the knuckles, his own knuckles, then it was a proper urine. If, he, if it was dark and he couldn't see it, then the urine was, was too thick. I think the interesting thing here is that the study of uroscopy went on for over a thousand years. Remember, it was started in 700 AD. The signs of urine catalog what you should look for in uroscopy. Uh, in uroscopy, you should determine the, uh, the, the disease by looking at the color of the urine. And this is, remember the 20 gradations of the colors of the urine. Uh, King George III, who was insane and had abdominal crises, probably had porphyria, his urine was blue. Uh, you looked at the consistency of the urine, the sediment, the shape, the consistency, the color, the smell, and diabetic urine is sweet. It's the uroscopy in the method is mentioned in Shakespeare. Falstaff, sire, you giant, what say the doctor to my water? Page, he said, sir, the water was a good healthy water, but for the party that owned it, he might have more diseases than he bargained for. The, the, the financial gains from uroscopy are sort of similar to what we see today. And you see this in this advertisement in 1580 from a Dublin physician who advertised the practice of sending a urine flask by messenger for analysis. And it says, looking at each patient's urine without visitation of such patient is sixpence sterling. sterling. For every visitation of such patient and view of his water, 12 pence sterling. The cost of medical care, even in those times, was, was expensive. And I thought that this really 
reminded me of the difference between a virtual and an in-person uh, examination. Urine has been used for therapy, embrocations, compressions of tumors, whole body foot baths, eye, ear, nose rubs. Wound cleaning is late as the 20th century in uh, Grapes of Wrath. They mentioned that for wound cleaning, a combination of spider webs and urine uh, could be used. Oral intake of urine has been used to treat viral and bacterial infections and cystitis and prostatitis. In drinking uh, urine, you had to do it properly. It should be a freshly voided urine in the morning. To get used to the bitter taste, you should slowly increase the amount each day. And of course, like all other good medicines, there are side effects such as nausea, vomiting, headache, palpitations, diarrhea, and fever. Mohraj Desai, the Prime Minister of India in 1977-1979, not that long ago, uh, was a practitioner of drinking his own urine, and he advocated urine as therapy. He also mentioned that if you soak your eyes in urine, it will prevent, if you start it early enough, you'll prevent cataracts. There are good things, potential beneficial substances in urine, such as urea, which inhibits the growth of gonococci, Uric acid destroys free radicals. There are cytokines, hormones, estrogen, uh, growth hormones in the urine. There are inhibitors of the growth of TB, rabies, and polio. Dechiroinositol is in the urine of normal people, and it decreases serum glucose. And several years ago, Joe Larner, um, who was the chair of pharmacology at the University of Virginia, started a startup company to get the decarinositol out of the urine. I think they've given up on that and they get it now from uh, antibiotics. Urine even has had a role in the Civil War. When the Southern gunpowder manufacturer, John Harrelson, found himself short of the cru crucial raw material, he petitioned the ladies of Selma, Alabama to contribute their urine to the war effort. The Confederate soldiers then made this poem. John Harrelson, John Harrelson, you are a wretched creature. You've added to this bloody war a new and awful feature. You've have us think while every man is bound to be a fighter, the ladies, bless their dear, should save their pee for nighter. John Harrelson, John Harrelson, where did you get the notion to send your barrel around the town to gather up the lotion? We thought that girls had work enough making shirts and kissing, but you have put the pretty dears to patriotic pissing. The, the Union soldiers uh, had the reply. John Harrelson, John Harrelson, we've read the storm and sorry, how women's tears through all the years have moistened fields of glory, but never was it told before amid such scenes of slaughter your Southern beauties dried their tears and went to making water. John Harrelson, John Harrelson, no wonder that your boys are brave. Houdin couldn't be a fighter if every time he fired his gun, he used his sweetheart's niter. And what would make a Yankee soldier sadder than dodging bullets fired from a, human, from a pretty woman's bladder? The collection of urine has continued to the 20th and 21st century. Uh, you can see this in this pen and ink, uh, watercolor of a short robe surgeon catheterizing the patient while the others look on. And we have continued even here in the 20th and 21st century uh, to, uh, to, to the 20th and 21st century. But now you know what happened. the nitric oxide period continued. Uh, in the nitrates, it was well known that nitrates are reduced to nitrites. And it's also well known that urinary nitrites are increased in infected urine. We also noted that nitric oxide uh, could be oxidized to nitrites. And that would be a possible that other 
cause for increased nitrites, which you which we all know is in the urine of infected in infected urine. And what you would see is that the nitric oxide formed would be oxidized to nitrites and nitrates. The nitrates then could be reduced by the bacteria uh, to nitrites. We thus postulated that the nitric oxide may be another source of nitrites. We first showed that L-arginine, the substrate for nitric oxide production, uh, caused an increase in the nitrate production in whole urine infected urine. That those whole urine is urine that contains both bacteria and cells, inflammatory cells. If you look at the filtrate of the infected urine, where there's bacteria but no cells, then if you look at that, the uh, you did not see the increase in nitrite that you see uh, in the whole urine. These data suggested um, th suggested that the NASA activity may be in the polymorphic nuclear leukocytes in the inflammatory cells in the urine. This was against the dogma of the day. The dogma of the day was there is no NOS activity in human polymorphic nuclear sites. We went on to show uh, that the NOS activity was higher in the leukocyte enriched fractions isolated from infected urine than from uninfected urine. And ultimately, in the JCI paper, showed that indeed the INAS is localized in the polymorphic nucleosites. You see it there on the right. And the left, what we did is we, we labeled the, the cells with CD45, which is seen in all uh, inflammatory cells. So now we now know that indeed it, the NOS activity is there. Uh, this just shows that the nitric oxide could be formed from nitric uh, and from the nitrites. Uh, quote, Aris, Arat demonstratum. That which was to be demonstrated was demonstrated. The dogma of the day had been changed. These data challenged the dogma of the day that NAS activity was not present in human polymorphic nucleosides. The reason why we were the first to show that INAS was present in human inflammatory cells, whereas others had failed, is that only urologists would have looked at infected urine where the INAS was, was induced and elevated. In the words of John Maynard Keynes, the economist, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. This could be reworded. Today's dogma is tomorrow's dog shit. Another alternative is that it was even a blind squirrel finds a nut occasionally. Perhaps this is the way we will study urine in, in the future. Now, I don't want you to think that being an academic uh, surgeon scientist is all work. Uh, and I've re paraphrased uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's gondoliers. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles and long hours that it takes to make a surgeon scientist. Yet the duties can be delightful and the privileges can be great, but the privilege and the pleasure that I've treasured beyond measure is to travel and to lecture in the US, Europe, and Asia. And remember the video game, where in the world is Rob Price? He's having pleasure, he's traveling, and he's lecturing. In the late 90s, one of our residents, Hubert Swana, uh, who's now a pediatric urologist, became aware that one of the professors in pathology, Dario Altieri, had isolated surviving, which is an anti-apoptotic protein in multiple cancers, not, not any GU cancers. And Hubert went on and published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, this paper showing that Survivin was uh, expressed in larger amounts in high-grade bladder tumors than in low-grade bladder tumors. This serendipitously placed us 
ready for the future. Shannon Smith did go ahead and show that the 16.5 kilodalton uh, surviving protein on Western blood was in the urine of patients with TCC, but not in the patient, not in the urine of uh, normals. This, as I said, serendipitously led us to the next stage. We wanted to downregulate surviving. One of the ways would be to use an siRNA. The problem is that siRNAs have a very short half-life and their dwell time in the bladder would not be good. So thus, the next period occurred, the nanoparticle period. We approached uh, Dr. Mark Saltzman, the Goizita Foundation Professor and Chair of the Department of Biomedical Engineering, who Peter has worked with uh, for years. And Mark had uh, encapsulated many drugs and mRNAs, but he had never encapsulated an sRNA. And so that he became excited with our idea. Uh, and we were the first, one of the first groups to nano, uh, encapsulate sRNAs in nanoparticles. This we parlayed into a NIH challenge grant and recruitment to the future. And most of you know who the future is. It's uh, Daryl Martin, who trained and got a degree in cancer molecular biology at Memorial University in Newfoundland, Canada. We recruited him as a postdoc on the challenge grant that we got. And now he is an assistant professor and independent investigator with his own extramural funding. When I look back at my career and the happiness, and what, what keys are to making it? As mentioned before, there were many men, uh, good mentors, good friends, collaborating, we, it, focusing on small independent uh, topics, which were important, was important. Remembering Yogi Berra's aphorism, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, and there were many forks. Serendipity and the ability to gain from adversity rather than be defeated by adversity is very important. There's one adversity, which I must admit, we've never been able to, to, to solve. Although, uh, although it, uh, I've mentioned that there's many happinesses and being a surgeon scientist is ever changing and very interesting, I think it's important not to forget this poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my work, she mighty and despair. Nothing besides remains. And of course, as I said, there's a hidden key to a successful academic career, a supportive spouse. I thank you. I'll begin. Um, in honoring um, our legacy, um, we want to celebrate what we're doing currently within our department. So for the next um, couple of hours, we have a, a variety of research presentations from our current faculty members, as well as our, our residents. To start off, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Petrolak. Uh, he's a professor of medicine and urology, and I think you know, he's one of the major recruitments that Kashula made um, in building our department. So um, Dr. Petrolak will be discussing or presenting his work on targeted therapy for locally advanced and metastatic urothelial cancer. Dr. Petrolak, take over. Good morning, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. And I'm sorry I'm out there in person. I just five weeks ago, and I had both of my knees replaced, so I'm still uh, rehabbing and recuperating. Uh, you know, it's an honor to be speaking here this morning. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it's 10 years ago that I signed on to come to Yale. It was quite a prolonged process. Uh, I remember very fondly talking with Dr. Weiss in the study uh, in New Haven about coming to Yale, and then unfortunately at that point, they did not have a chairman. I was a little bit reluctant uh, to come on board, and then Peter was hired. And uh, there was a dinner that came forth uh, in New York at restaurant called Porterhouse between Peter, myself, my wife, and uh, Roy Herbst. 
And that night I realized that this was the right place to be. And in the elevator going home that night, my wife turned around to me and said, you know, this is what you've been talking about for the last six months. This is the type of job that you wanted. And, um, and if you don't take this in six months, you're going to regret it. She was absolutely right. I, I was I'm absolutely honored to be here. It's interesting to see the history because I remember having many conversations with Dr. Latimer at, at Columbia at 10 o'clock at night by the Xerox machine on the 10th floor of Presbyterian about whether there were two gunmen in the Kennedy assassination. And he actually convinced me that it was probably only one. Uh, but he was also a treasured figure. And not only was he an, an absolutely brilliant urologist, but he was also a, a Renaissance man who collected many, many pieces of historical memorabilia. And I think these are the people in medicine that you really come across and, and, and really enjoy being around. And, and again, Peter, uh, thank you for recruiting me. Uh, same thing with Dr. Weiss. And, and I look forward to working with Dr. Kim over the next several years. So I'm going to highlight some of the work that our group, I think, is most proud of, targeted therapy for advanced metastatic urothelial carcinoma. I so <clears throat> in the early part of uh, this decade or last decade, all the rage was immune therapy and urothelial carcinoma. We first started seeing improvements in survival uh, with drugs such as pembrolizumab uh, and, and, and uh, tezolizumab. And I brought this technology with me uh, from uh, collaboration with a, a small company called Agenesis when I was at Columbia uh, of targeted therapy for urothelial carcinoma. These are smart bombs. And fortimavidotin is an antibody drug conjugate, which uh, the antibody recognizes nectin-4, which is expressed in approximately 90% of urothelial carcinoma. So it's, it's, it's essentially a targeted therapy that you don't need to check the target for. This delivers four molecules of something called monomethyloristatin, otherwise known as MMAE. It binds to the urothelial carcinoma uh, cancer cell. Uh, it's uh, endocytized and then cleaved in the lysosome. And the uh, molecules are then liberated to disrupt microtubules, cause cell, cell death and cell cycle arrest, and also cause bystander killing. So this drug has a basically the same mechanism of action as antitubulin agents and taxanes, but it can deliver high doses to the cancer cell. And next slide, please. And we started phase one and phase two trials with this drug. We were impressed with some of the responses that we saw. And this led to a registration trial, EV201, in two different cohorts of patients. Those patients who had prior chemotherapy and prior checkpoint therapy in cohort one. And then the second cohort, those patients were not eligible to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And this was designed to get accelerated approval of the drug. Next slide, please. What we saw in this trial in cohort one was a response rate, which was similar to phase one. And I think that's the remarkable thing about this drug. The data is consistent from phase one to phase two to phase three. An objective response rate of 44% in refractory patients, 12% complete response rate. And that was enough to grant accelerated approval by the FDA in December of 2019. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, overall survival, about 12 months, duration of survival at 7.6 months. But what's most remarkable is that the responses are the same in each organ site. So if a patient has METs to the liver, the response rate is 40%. And that it was pretty much unheard of because we know the chemotherapy really doesn't work well for that state of disease. Same thing with immune therapy. Next slide, please. We saw a similar pattern in those patients who are not eligible to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So this upfront chemotherapy, 88% of the accessible patients had some form of response, complete response rate of approximately 20%. And this also led to an accelerated approval in this group of patients who are platinum ineligible. Next slide. Of course, a phase three trial is necessary to determine whether uh, this is better than the standard of care. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year uh, in Fortimab. Uh, next slide, compared to standard of care chemotherapy uh, in the third line setting. And as we see here, uh, very, very similar data, median survival of 13 months and uh, compared to about nine months for the control arm. But we have patients from that original phase one study who had metastases to liver, metastases to lung, who are alive five and six years after their uh, relapse after primary treatment. So this is an active drug. It does have some issues and complications, which we'll get into a little bit later. Next slide, please. 
So, well, why can't we expand the use of chemotherapy in urothelial carcinoma? We know that for platinum eligible patients, uh, for, not, for muscle invasive disease, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radical cystectomy is a standard of care. So what do you do for a cisplatinum ineligible patient? Well, they're not afforded the ability because of, of the lack of activity of carboplatinum uh, and lack of survival benefit. They're not for, afforded the ability to receive systemic therapy to clean up that micrometastatic disease prior to surgery. So uh, this is a trial that we helped to lead. We actually presented this trial at ASCO GU this year of infortimab vidotin given for three cycles as neoadjuvant chemotherapy for those patients who were ineligible to receive cisplatinum. Patients then underwent a radical cystectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection. And then they were followed every three to four months uh, for progression afterwards. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the demographics for the patients in this trial. Median age was 75. Uh, pr practically all these patients were smokers. It was predominantly T2 disease, but there are some patients who had more advanced disease at T3 and T4. That's about a quarter of patients overall. And predominantly urothelial carcinoma, but we did have other histological subtypes, including micropapillary carcinoma. Next slide, please. So what were the reasons for these patients uh, being ineligible? Predominantly uh, creatinine clearance of less than 60, uh, but also about 40% of patients had grade two or greater hearing loss. And again, there was some criticism about this, but the fact is, is that we were reluctant to put patients on cisplatinum chemotherapy, lose hearing, and then of course, uh, that's permanent once it happens. Uh, but again, this is, I think, reflective of the overall general population. Next slide. So this is uh, the administration of infortimab before, chemo, before radical cystectomy. The duration of treatment was 2.1 months. 19 of the 22 patients completed all three cycles of neoadjuvant infortimab, and all patients eventually underwent surgery without any delay in their treatment. Uh, at this particular point, 86% of patients are still on study, and three patients have died subsequently afterwards. We'll get, get into that uh, momentarily. Next slide. So this is the pathological complete response rate. It's 36.4%. The downstage rate is defined by the presence of T0, TIS, TA, or T1 uh, was 50%. This is comparable to what we see with neoadjuvant cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. So we were very, very excited about these results and not yet, of course, in a randomized trial, but in a small study, I think that this is, I think, at least good indication that we would like to carry on further with this particular approach. Next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the side effects that we see with this drug. The predominant one that we have to watch out for is peripheral neuropathy. Um, and that occurred at about 27% of patients. Uh, there were some dose reductions because of this particular issue, but we did have three deaths which occurred post-operatively. Uh, Two were from cardiovascular issues. One had a cardio, cardiac arrest and the other one had a pulmonary embolus. A uh, third patient had acute kidney injury. But this has also been criticized as being somewhat higher than what we would expect. However, this is a small population of patients. And again, these are patients that may not have seen systemic therapy for a variety of different reasons. So they may overall have been a little bit sicker than the general population. Next slide, please. Uh, this, again, is treatment-related events leading to a dose reduction uh, or inter interruption, 13%. Uh, and again, predominantly diarrhea, fatigue, dysgenesia, and dehydration. Next slide, please. Again, adverse events of, of, of interest, peripheral neuropathy, skin reaction, hyperglycemia, op ocular disorders, as well as infusion reactions. Next slide. So I... I, I in the interest of time, I didn't show this data, but we, we've also gone forth with the combination of infortimab plus pembrolizumab in platinum ineligible patients. And we've seen a high response rate and a high survival in metastatic disease. In fact, the survival uh, for a typical patient with metastatic disease is anywhere between 14 and 18 months. And a randomized phase two that's going on right now, it's 27 months. And uh, this is the part, part of a larger randomized phase three. So neoadjuvant fortimab is, is promising, but there are trials that are now going on, and we are actually looking at slightly different schedules uh, of infortimab combined with pembrolizumab in neoadjuvant therapy. But I think the, the, the overall 
uh, complete response rate of 36% is quite impressive. Uh, there was no delay in surgery due, due to neoadjuvant fortimab. Uh, the safety profile is that of what we see with the overall drug. And uh, this is supporting our subsequent phase two and phase three trials, uh, that one of which is open at, now at Yale, giving in Fortimab for three cycles pre-op and then in Fortimab for, uh, for three cycles post-op in uh, platinum and eligible patients. So again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to present this data. And I, I, I really think that, that Yale has provided me with a second wind in my career. And I, I enjoy and cherish the relationships that I have developed with urology, radiation oncology, and all of my colleagues at this institution. Thank you so much. Dr. Petronak, I just have one question. Sure. Um, on the mechanism of the neuropathy, what is the proposed or possible mechanism explanation for that? So, uh, you know, even though nectin is expressed almost ubiquitous in urothelial carcinoma, there are other sites in normal tissue that's expressed and neuronal tissue is one of them. Uh, this is also a, a target that's expressed in several different tumor types, uh, ovarian cancer, lung cancer. Uh, we've actually, Peter Humphreys and I've looked in prostate and found that some of the more poorly differentiated prostate cancers do express nectin as well, thus would justify a, a trial in this group of patients. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the mechanism. There are other delivery mechanisms that are now being uh, uh, used of MMAE. One is called the bicycle, which is a bispecific protein that uh, actually goes to the ex extracellular matrix. And in a phase one trial that was presented uh, at uh, AACR a couple of weeks ago, there may be actually less peripheral neuropathy with that, that, uh, that construct. So we're continuing to investigate, A, the mechanisms of action, B, the optimal patient. You know, I often joke that it's almost like you know Seinfeld, uh, a uh, a show without uh, without a show that has no uh, no no meaning or whatever. It's a targeted therapy that you don't need to check the target to, but we still don't have a good molecular marker to tell us who should receive this ADC versus other ADCs that are out there at this point. Thank you. Um, I think that trial about Megden or the Fortimab and prostate cancer. Let's do it here. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, for the all right, so uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Juan Javier Deloge. He's one of our graduates uh, recently from 2020. He's currently a second year SUO fellow at UC San Diego, where he'll be continuing as a faculty member this July. Um, I asked Juan to summarize his surgical interests, his surgical and research interests, and he described himself, quote, as a Leapman Kenny sprinkle hybrid with a little bit of Dr. Hess. Yikes. <laughs> like his words, yikes. Okay. Um, although his uh, fact, uh, although I was his faculty member uh, during his time here as resident as a resident, so I will take full uh, credit for all of his accomplishments following graduation. So since graduating, Juan has published over 20 peer-reviewed articles in journals such as Urologic Oncology, Urology, JAMA Open, and Cancer. He recently served as the chair of the AUA resident fellows section, was just selected to be an early career editor on the editorial board of the Journal of Urology. And although this hasn't been publicized yet, he just received a two-year grant from the Urology Care Foundation. Uh, I'm sure you all share my pride and admiration for Juan and all that he's accomplished so far. I'm sure he'll, his trajectory will continue to rise and he will continue to be a strong example of a Yale graduate. We're lucky to have him back today where he will be discussing his health services research with a focus on disparities in germline genetic testing for prostate cancer. Thank you, Juan. Thanks for the introduction and uh, sorry I couldn't be there, but thank you so much for the invitation and I look forward to uh, seeing you all in person in uh, New Orleans. So today, as Dr. Mona Medinia had mentioned, I'll be discussing uh, research in prostate cancer with a specific focus on genetic or germline testing um, as it pertains to race and ethnicity. Next slide. So as many of us know, there's a bunch of different tests that we can now order for patients. Pre-diagnostic tests, um, you know, post-diagnostic tests to cipher, uh, Promark, and well as um, germline testing. Next slide. So why the focus on germline genetic testing? Well, there was a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2016 that looked at inherited DNA repair gene mutations 
in men with metastatic prostate cancer. Next slide. And what they found was that in a subset of men that there was a preponderance towards uh, DNA repair mutation, specifically in uh, BRCA2, BRCA1, as well as some other genes. Next slide. And as we found about 12% of patients ended up um, harboring uh, DNA repair mutations, but there were also patients with localized prostate cancer that had DNA repair mutations as well. Next slide. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what do the guidelines say about genetic testing? Well, the most recent iteration of the NCCN and the AUA guidelines recommend genetic testing for all men with very high risk disease, high risk disease, as well as intermediate low risk disease with a strong family history. Next slide. And many of these mutations that we are now aware of are actually becoming actionable. Germline or somatic mutations and homologous recombination repair um, now is, um, has a, a proposed susceptibility to PARP inhibitors as well as platinum-based chemotherapy. And it's believed that um, immune checkpoint inhibitors can be used in DNA mismatch repair genes for patients with G, uh, DNA mismatch repair genes. Next slide. Or is there a role for genetic testing in the active surveillance cohort? Next slide. This is a publication in European Urology where they actually went back and they sequenced about a thousand patients that were eligible for active surveillance um, to determine whether or not they had germline mutations. Next slide. And they found that patients, if they had a germline mutation were about two to three times more likely to progress to uh, more aggressive prostate cancer or uh, excuse me, upgraded on um, repeat biopsy if they had a germline mutation. Next slide. This is a graphical representation of this, showing the likelihood of patients that were eligible for active surveillance with the, with the germline uh, mutation uh, being more likely to be upgraded uh, on repeat biopsy. Here you can see on the left, BRCA1, BRCA2, as well as an ATM mutation versus BRCA2 alone, BRCA2 alone being um, likely the greatest predictor of grade group progression on repeat biopsy. Next slide. But one of the problems with a lot of these studies is it's predominantly made up of Caucasian men. Um, if you look at the John Hopkins cohort from this study, it was about 90% white, 57% African-American, the North Shore group about 98% Caucasian. Next slide. Which brings us to my next point. So how do you actually study race and ethnicity? What's the best way to study it? Is it self-identified race and ethnicity? Is it genetic um, so, uh, race and ethnicity? Next slide. So there's something called genome-wide associations, yep, okay. Click through. Uh, which is a study of genome-wide uh, set of genetic variants to see if any variant is associated with a trait. For the most part, GWAS uh, focuses on something called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Next. And uh, it's believed that SNPs in the non-coding, which is found in the non-coding regions of DNA can manifest itself in higher risk of cancer. Now SNPs, as we may or may not know, is actually used in many of our ancestry traits or our ancestry studies. Ancestry 23andMe um, basically looks at your SNPs and it's also used in pets. For those of you who don't remember, this is my dog Juan Jr. Um, so I, I actually had sequenced uh, JJ when I, was, uh, when I was a resident here. We're looking at her SNPs and we can see that um, she's made up of a mix of uh, Border Collie and Australian Shepherd. So I teamed up with our computational biology department here at UCSD with a, who uh, focused on bioinformatics and did a principal component analysis. A principal component analysis is basically a summation of patient SNPs into a single data point. And we took a cohort of men with about 100,000 men with prostate cancer and we sequenced them based on their SNPs to see, you know, you know how, how more likely they were to, uh, how well their self-identified race and ethnicity correlated with their genetic race and identity. Next slide. So if you look here on the left, when you look at self-identified race and ethnicity, you can see for the most part, the, the little dots don't actually cluster very well, particularly for Hispanic patients, Mexican-Americans um, tend to be mixed in with European-Americans as, as, well as, um, as well as Asian. And we found that self-identified race and ethnicity doesn't explain variants very well when it comes to genetics. Next slide. 
But when you group patients based on their genetic ancestry, their genetic SNPs, um, we actually found that the patients cluster a lot better. When we looked at germline mutational burden, this is data we haven't yet published, we actually found no differences um, in the number of mutational burden uh, for germline genetics when we stratified patients by genetic ancestry. The most important part of this is, is really the one, which is the number of um, variants or germline mutations that patients have. Um, the, the bars here in the, in the one column you can see are, are pretty much similar. There's no significant difference in terms of germline mutations between any of the groups. Next slide. Now, when we think about self-identified race and ethnicity and we study uh, prostate cancer and germline mutations that way, what we found over time is that most patients don't actually have access to the testing. Um, this is a publication that we published over the last year in prostate cancer and prostatic diseases, looking at disparities in germline, patient, uh, germline testing among racial minorities with prostate cancer. And what we found is that there are a number of reasons why patients don't have access to testing. One of the main reasons is a shortage of genetic counselors. It's no longer probably feasible to rely on genetic counselors to provide genetic testing um, because there's too many patients that are now eligible for testing. Um, there's also differences in the quality of care for minorities, mistrust of the healthcare system, lack of knowledge and education about testing amongst the patients themselves, um, provider bias, as well as their own comfort with counseling, concerns about costs and confidentiality, as well as differences based on regional um, location of the patients, as well as the, the healthcare system that they're in. So we had actually teamed up with Invite um, to do another study looking at germline alterations in Hispanic men. And Invite was kind enough to give us a cohort of about 17,000 patients that underwent germline testing. Uh, we also use our own patients in a single cohort study to look at um, the proportions of pathologic as well as likely pathologic alterations, as well as variants of uncertain significance. We then perform multivariable logistic regression, um, adjusting for demographic and clinical factors to examine factors of why patients were more likely to get germline testing. And um, for the most part, the only thing that we found in terms of um, differences similar to the, the uh, when we look at patients genetically compared to Europeans, was a slightly higher preponderance to check to, but overall, the, the, in terms of the mutational burden, it was, was pretty similar. Next slide. Here you can see similarly in the Invite cohort, predominantly non-Hispanic white, 96% of the population. When we looked at the pathogenic alteration rate, you can see here the p-value was not significant, um, no significant differences between the two. Okay, animation. The next one. The next one. But one of the things that was significant from a scientific standpoint was um, Hispanic patients were more likely to have variations of unknown significance. So by under testing this population of patients, there's actually a large cohort of patients in the US that we actually have variations that we don't know anything about. And we, when you look at reasons why patients underwent genetic testing, reasons why they did not undergo genetic testing is if they were more likely to be Spanish speaking. Next. If they were more likely to have metastatic disease, they were more likely to undergo genetic testing. And if their cancer care involved a medical oncologist, they were nine times more likely to undergo genetic testing. And it turns out one of the biggest drivers for uh, patients not getting genetic testing, testing is actually urologists. Now, you know, the hemox and the, and the radiation oncologists, I think a little bit more familiar but uh, you know, urologists for the most part are, are probably the, the least likely to refer to or least likely to order genetic testing. Um, you, know, you may say that's partly due to the fact that you know, most of these patients it's recommended for metastatic disease. But as I had showed you earlier, there is likely a larger cohort of patients um, with localized disease that you know, should undergo testing. Thanks. So this is the grant I just got approved for the Urology Care Foundation. It is a pilot study to improve germline testing in at-risk patients. This was uh, my mentor team at the top here, Raina McKay, Dr. Dr. Kane, as well as Lisa Medlinski, who is a genetics um, counselor here at uh, the UCSD Morse Cancer Center. Um, and this is Dr. Savage here from San Diego State University from the School of Communication, um, who we teamed up with.
Next slide. And we formed a patient-centered clinical trial. So the focus of this trial is really the engagement of the patients. So by utilizing the health system of UCSD, San Diego State University, as well as germline testing, we formed a, uh, a, a single institution clinical trial. This is my award here from uh, Neurology Care Foundation, Bristol Myles Squibbs. And what we plan to do is we, well, the intervention is mostly made, but um, what we plan to do is we plan to randomize patients um, with a particular focus on Hispanic patients to a video education session as opposed to the typical genetics counseling session uh, to determine whether or not they're more likely to undergo um, genetic testing in the end. Next slide. And this is just a quick uh, one minute clip of the video that we had made for our uh, trial. This is actually one of, uh, one of our prostate cancer survivors, Lenny Green, um, going along with our patient engagement clinical trial. Go to the next slide. So in conclusion, germline testing um, likely to continue to play a critical role, both uh, most likely for patients, not only with metastatic disease, but also for localized prostate cancer. However, there are disparities in who actually has a, um, access to the test themselves and interventions and trials will be critical in erasing disparities and, and likely should be patient center focused. I better take any questions. Yeah, so, so the idea is to move the testing basically from the genetics counseling to um, the urology clinic um, and for urologists actually to order the tests themselves. I, I think as we found and as we've kind of done our interviews with some of the urologists here, um, you know, for the most part, you know, some of the major barriers are, you know, you know, urologists don't actually even know how to physically order the tests, like what, you know, what genetic, you know, hereditary cancer panel do you order from um, companies like Ambry or Invitae? Um, number two, what do you, how do you counsel the patients themselves? What, what risks, what are the risks involved with um, getting genetic testing on patients um, in terms of confidentiality? For the most part, there isn't a lot. Um, patients for the most part are protected by the GINA Act. Um, and then the, the second is what do you do with the result? You know, like once you get a result, how do you counsel patients on the results themselves? So, you know, not featured here, but we have it in a whole algorithm on, on the next best steps. Um, the most likely result, interestingly, um, for a lot of these tests is that patients get a negative result. It's not, for the most part, you know, you know the preponderance of, of, of genetic mutations um, in the metastatic and specifically the localized setting is it's not that high. It's probably about one in eight patients. It's significant and those patients are more likely to harbor lethal prostate cancer. Um, but I, I think that, you know, getting a negative test is pretty easy to counsel on. It gets a little tricky once you get to that kind of variance and the, um, as well as the mutations themselves. But at that point, you know, it's kind of the expectations that urologists or, or medical oncologists refer the, the patients to the genetics counselors. But, you know, the way that I kind of, uh, you know, describe this to a lot of patients, it's, it's a little bit like PSA testing, you know, you know, urologists don't order PSA tests in the screening population for the most part. It's, you know, we get the, the, the elevated PSA from primary care. And then we do the workup after that. And I think that is likely that we're the approach that we're going to have to take when it um, um, goes towards um, goes for genetic testing.
think you're falling into the same trap with the, the, the presentation that you made there, because you're assuming that many of those Central American and Mexican patients are literate, which a lot of them are not. And you're asking, you're speaking in English, and you have uh, to make them read something that many of them may not be able to read. I would recommend that you consider generating that video in Spanish. Uh, we're, we're dubbing it. Yeah, we are dubbing it. That, that's just the, that's the rough cut. We haven't yeah. officially launched the trial, but thank you. Juan, uh, great talk. It was great seeing you. Uh, quick question. A person who is uh, a urologist thinks is a candidate for active surveillance, do you believe most people should really go for genetic testing on you know now? Uh, so it, it really depends on their family history. Um, so, you know, a patient with low risk disease or intermediate risk disease, you know, you're thinking about putting that patient active surveillance, they have a strong family history of prostate cancer, which is a first degree relative with greater than grade group one. So grade group two prostate cancer, or if they had a, if they have a family member who died from prostate cancer in the past, that's definitely a patient who I would order genetic testing on. Um, there's actually a study that was, I think was presented at AUA last year by Neil Shore looking at patients that were eligible for genetic testing based on the NCC and guidelines. And they found for the most part, you know, it, it was, if you follow the guidelines or not, it didn't I mean there was still a, a large number of patients with germline mutations, both in the patients that was recommended for testing, as well as the patients with localized disease that were not recommended for testing, which means that I, I think it's probably going to become more commonplace really for all patients with prostate cancer getting um, genetic testing. So for right now, to go back to your question, I think an active surveillance patient with low risk disease with a strong family history should get um, a prostate hereditary cancer panel. I have one last question about the I was wondering what your thoughts are on the variance of unknown significance, because that's actually the second most common result that I've seen. And uh, the companies are supposed to continue to cycle those variants through until they actually become relevant. <coughs> So what is the follow-up for your patients, and how do you counsel them with variants? They're still quite anxious to see those variants. Yeah, you know, the, the, the general follow-up or the follow-up plan is that all these patients get referred to um, genetics, um, and, uh, you know, the company is supposed to contact the patient once they get a, um, a variant back that turns out to be pathologic. Um, not a perfect system. I, you know, I, I think the, you know, Invite has talked about, you know, filtering out variants of unknown significance in the report themselves, but, you know, it, we unfortunately don't have a perfect plan for, for the follow-up itself. I, I just want to say, Juan, this is Peter. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation and uh, congratulations on both your grant and your faculty position. Thanks so much. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, next talk, um, Dr. Michael Liebman, uh, our faculty member here. Uh, he'll be presenting his work on learning from patient experience with new toxic and diagnostics. So change the change it a little bit. <laughs> Same idea. Someone's patient in portal approaches to access to various prostate cancer. Thank you very much, and um, welcome, Dr. Shulam. It's great to see everyone. It's great to be back together. And I'm really pleased to follow Juan's talk and, and really see where our legacy has gone. It's amazing to see what Juan has done and the future clearly is bright. So I wanna talk about some of our work uh, looking at active surveillance for prostate cancer and really take a new perspective on it, kind of delve our toe into a more provocative question and a different way of looking at the experience and the outcome of active surveillance. So, All right, so I have no disclosures other than I have some uh, technical difficulties. So, you know, we're talking about legacy today. And I think something that's been very helpful to me is really simplifying down the way we think about our duty here and what we do. And I think that was distilled down perfectly when I came here to, into a tripartite mission. And I'm sort of a sim you know, simple person. I like a, an easy heuristic. What do I have to do today? And I credit Dr. Shulam with really encapsulating that mission into three parts. Deliver world-class care to our patients, take great care of them, ask and answer urgent and provocative research questions, and train the future of the field. So our legacy is strong. We heard from Dr. Weiss about where we've come from and where we're going. 
We've just heard from Juan about where the future is headed and we've, that's clearly bright. And already getting the sense of some of these provocative questions um, that really animate the future and take us to where we're going. So the overview today uh, is to talk about active surveillance for prostate cancer. And I wanna draw a distinction between those questions that we measure and the methodologies we use to measure quantitative things and begin to think about the other aspect of active surveillance and the decision-making aspect. What happens on the individual human being and personal level? And those are things that are harder to measure. Those are things you can't really easily assign a p-value to, you can't assign a hazard ratio to it, but that's actually what it comes down to. How does a human being make a decision and how do you follow a chronic disease like prostate cancer long-term if it's not being treated? And then delve into some of our work from qualitative research, in-depth interviews with patients, to inform some of these strategies. So I wanna start with a common experience I think that's well known to all of us in this room, a 53 year old gentleman who's referred for a second opinion of what looks like low risk prostate cancer. He has a PSA of 4.1, undergoes a prostate biopsy and is found to have grade group one prostate cancer. He has a MRI of the prostate which confirms no visible lesion. He undergoes genomic testing which also looks favorable. And so on paper, he looks like the ideal candidate for active surveillance. And we're very reassured to tell him that it is the preferred management for low risk prostate cancer. It is safe with a less than 1% risk of mortality within 10 years. And the monitoring is relatively straightforward, it involves PSA monitoring, periodic biopsy, and repeat examination. But the patient confides to us that he is really paralyzed by this anxiety and uncertainty of living with cancer that he understands intellectually that this cancer is probably not gonna kill him, but he's still living with cancer um, and doesn't know what to do. So, you know, he is not alone. Active surveillance is the dominant initial management strategy for patients with, with low risk cancer. This is data from SEER published in 2019, looking at the ascent of active surveillance, the decrease of definitive treatment for low risk prostate cancer. So there are hundreds of thousands of patients and probably the prevalence of, of active surveillance as well over a million patients are involved in active monitoring of their disease. And so my interest since training and in my faculty appointment has been in understanding how we can make this experience and outcome better for patients, the rising number of patients in this category. And I've been primarily interested in questions of the use of new technologies and how they may facilitate the uptake and closing that gap from 50% to 100% in, in terms of initial selection of active surveillance. And so we've gone about this using many different observational research approaches to understand how does receiving a technology or being counseled in a certain way change the decision that someone undergoes. And we've done this in a host of different ways looking at observational data sets. And I wanna highlight one of our studies looking at administrative claims from Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's methodologically difficult to ask the question, okay, did having an MRI or having a genomic test actually make you make a better decision? Many of the companies that have led these studies have tried to infer that there is clinical utility because people will change their management, but that's usually based on surveys of doctors, many of, of whom are conflicted because they work for the companies. So we tried to take advantage of the well-known variation in practice patterns. And it's very well documented that in prostate cancer and many other prostate cancer services, there's tremendous regional variation based on the zip code that you live in, based on the hospital referral region that you live in, based on the state and the region. And we use this as a natural, a convenient natural experiment, an ecological design to ask the question, does living in a region with high relative to low adoption of MRI and genomic testing, is that associated with a greater change in the uptake of active monitoring. And so that's what we did. We identified a cohort of over 65,000 patients out of a larger cohort of over 100 million patients of Blue Cross Blue Shield beneficiaries and performed a series of model experiments and found that there was a significant association. Living in a hospital referral region with high rates of MRI use and high rates of genomic testing use was associated with a significantly greater increase in observation for prostate cancer. So this begins to tell us that there's at least some connection between 
undergoing these technologies, undergoing these tests, and being monitored for cancer. We did a similar study looking in SEER Medicare, where we performed various um, statistical approaches to account for potential confounding in the selection of these testing, including propensity score matching, and found that there, there is still a strong association between undergoing an MRI and undergoing sur un active surveillance for prostate cancer. But we've always, always been interested in the question of what happens in the real world. As Juan really nicely said, the, almost the totality of evidence comes from very few cohorts, predominantly academic medical centers and randomized trials. But what happens in the real world is often very different. Um, and this is unpublished data that we just finished analyzing, looking at the real world practice of active surveillance. And this is data from Medicare beneficiaries. And we asked the question, what happens in the real world? Are patients getting PSA tests? Are they getting MRIs? Are they getting confirmatory biopsy? And the results are actually pretty sobering. Very, very few patients are actually getting repeat biopsies. PSA compliance is pretty decent, but it drops off over time and similar with MRI. So less than 20% of patients are actually getting beyond one year additional biopsy testing. And the message here is there is clearly a discordance between what is recommended in the guidelines, what is recommended in institutional protocols, and what's actually being done. So the question is, why might that be? And I think that's where we hit a wall with, our obs with the observational research. There's no clear reason. You can look at demographic risk factors and clinical risk factors for being compliant or non-compliant, but ultimately, the human mind and the human being is the prism and the lens through which all of these decisions are happening. We're very focused on the left here, what we can measure, okay? Demographics, age, ethnicity, uh, Gleason score. But the reality is that compliance and participation in surveillance, especially over the longitudinal lifespan, is all a question of human decision. And so we have been disproportionately focused here and we're making a lot of inroads in understanding individual trajectories, right? What clinical parameters are associated with reclassification? Or maybe we'll have a new genomic test or a new imaging modality that's gonna help us identify more aggressive cancer. But we've paid considerably less attention to the cognitive and emotional states that contribute to decision-making. And that's where we wanna focus. I was very influenced by um, the work of Daniel Kahneman, who is a psychologist who wrote several books about this, about cognitive states and decision making. And in a seminal work in science in 1974, him and his collaborator identified different heuristics, different ways of cognitive processing that people do when they're faced with a state of uncertainty. And active surveillance in prostate cancer is a state of uncertainty. And they sort of distilled down three elements. One is representativeness. So when a patient is making a decision, they're tasked with finding the probability that the event they're experiencing belongs to a certain class that, that they can draw from in prior experience. And that may be, should I be treated? They also rely on prior experience uh, in order to make estimates about numerical predictions. How risky is my cancer? Or how likely am I to reclassify over time? So again, this is the lens through which patients are making these decisions. They're not always making rational decisions. They're not all very um, accustomed to dealing with probabilities. So to help fill in those gaps of quantitative research, qualitative research can be very helpful. And what do I mean by qualitative research? This is really an in-depth form of inquiry to understand social phenomenon within their natural setting. These are looking at questions more of why rather than what and rely on the direct experiences of human beings because that's ultimately the subject matter and the, the, um, the, the end result of the decision making. And so we undertook a funded study to perform in-depth qualitative interviews of patients with low risk prostate cancer undergoing active surveillance who had genetic genomic testing or prostate MRI, because we are particularly interested in the cognitive processes associated with this influx of lots of new data. And so together with a research associate, we had one hour interviews with each patient. They were done via Zoom and transcribed. And then he and I 
went line by line and coded every single element, every distinct element that we could identify in those transcripts. Um, and it's really quite humbling to speak to patients and flip the tables around and ask simple questions. What was it like to go through this? Um, and you hear things that are illuminating, you know, and, the, and get an appreciation for the range of perceptions. People things like say things, you know, like I wasn't sure about the genetic thing. The MRI was loud and I couldn't breathe. No one told me about it and I wish I knew better. So very often you find things that are confirming what you, confirming the biases and what you think, but oftentimes they really are quite different. And so when we distilled down everything, we identified over 5,000 codes just from 20 transcripts um, and tried to break that down even further into key themes that emerged. Um, and I think there are really three I want to touch on. One is, what do patients want to know about their information? There's a spectrum, as we all know. We all have the patients who say, tell me everything. I want to know every last detail. They've read all the papers and they want to hear more. But there are also people for whom that is actually detrimental. And they want to know as little as possible. That information can be overwhelming for them. Same thing for autonomy and decision making. Some people want to call the shots, but for some people that's very overwhelming and they want their doctor to really help. And our particular interest was technology. Uh, for some, MRI genomic testing is very reassuring and that's the linchpin of surveillance for them. But for some, it's really quite overwhelming. And so the idea here is that a one-size-fits-all approach clearly does not work. Um, and I think it's made me much more critical of some of the decision tools that we use that are very monolithic, that think there's one way to go. The reality is that it's really quite diverse. And in order to meet the needs and close the gap, we really have to be far more varied in our approach. So where are we headed? Um, I think the takeaway is that as we make strides in science of prediction, we can't leave behind patients here, and, and we need to work to continue to close those gaps in comprehension and support at the same time as we do make those advances in understanding trajectories um, of patients and in the science behind prostate cancer. So I'll close there um, and say that active surveillance is a health state with high decisional and emotional and cognitive burden. We make and, and create statistical models that are rigid by design, and that's what we want. We want to make simplifications, but human beings are not. And so there really is a disconnect between our clinical models and the reality of decision making. So one size does not fit all. Um, and you know, we can inform our perspectives and broaden our horizons using qualitative research to help reveal blind spots and uh, pave the way for the future. So thanks for your time and attention, and I'll take any questions. Yeah, that's, I think that's really the question, right? Um, you know, the, the framework that we've taken away from this is that we should probably be doing more assessment at intake. And so what I've personally done is I've asked people, what's your, what's your style? And I think that you can size people up. There is, um, you know, I think once you get to know a patient, it becomes easy, right? But at the outset, you don't know that. So I think there's probably a lot of value in making those determinations and making those assessments to begin with. Are there any validated questionnaires that you're aware of in other fields that assess patient preference for information? I, I, don't, I don't think there are. And so that's something we're interested in doing is making that assessment. Because I think once we know the phenotype of the patient, what they want, it's pretty easy, right? To know this is someone who wants a lot of information, this is someone who doesn't want a lot of information. But um, we sometimes get it wrong. We think we know what they want and we don't. So I think that's what we should, probably should be doing. Do you think the patients have insight? Like, do they know themselves? It's good. That's also a good point. Maybe not. I mean, I think sometimes this only comes out of like an extensive interview that people realize, but it, it, that may be one of the barriers too, right? Yeah. Something I've noticed in my practice is that people's phenotypes seem to change too, that they might go on surveillance for a small renal mass and then be very, very comfortable with it. And then at some point um, start potentially be, uh, being more interested in data around likelihood of the progression and may think it's a different treatment. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I totally agree. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, so maybe there's an opportunity to check in periodically. And I mean, I think experienced clinicians do this intuitively, but when we're trying to scale something across the nation, um, there probably is a need to check in.
touch with you and you, you focus there on, on that process and you use that dedicated database and you get it by obviously <coughs> and MRI visualization and other time. Have you looked at has anyone done similar work? Has any other active surveillance program or cancer screening program where there may be a difference in that in the but to see why that is being or, or what's driving that difference? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that surveillance prostate has really like gone very far out ahead, but you're right. I mean, we're kidney cancer surveillance is an open field, thyroid cancer, low stage breast cancer. So that would be great to really try to unite them and see what are the commonalities, what are the differences? Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I think people, especially in prostate, patients move around quite a bit. It's really, it's, I mean, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, I don't know. People maybe get a second opinion, but prostate, you know, we, we began to look at this. The number of providers for a given patient is remarkable. People move around, and I think they do find someone who fits. I don't know that the patients change very much. Maybe they do, but uh, they seem to find someone who matches their, um, their needs eventually. And if they don't, if there's a discordance here, that can be disastrous. So, Michael, do you have any further follow up on those patients who are not compliant or who is the 20% having a continuous follow up? So, any insight into that population specifically? Is it a patient driven or is it physician driven? Well, and then any sort of outcomes and are they being worse? Uh, so in, in the Sear Medicare, we, we haven't looked at outcomes yet. There are demographic associations. Age is a big driver in it, of course. But in other studies, you know, non-compliance with active surveillance is associated with a significantly greater risk of, metas of metastasis. So I think that's what we'd like to do next is to understand what are the long-term outcomes of those patients? What can we do um, you know, to improve that? I think there's a massive room for an implementation science focused approach to look at that because it's not going to be a conventional approach. There's going to be something to have to bring those patients on board because they probably are at, at higher risk for failure. Thank you. I, I, I give up here. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, I have a uh, privilege of introducing our next speaker, uh, Danny Siegel. He's one of our fourth year residents here. Um, his interests include uh, robotics and minimally invasive surgery. He's currently applying for fellowships right now, so hopefully we'll be able to find out soonish. Um, and he's going to be presenting on analysis of etiology, uh, etiologic theories proposed to explain racial disparity in prostate cancer outcomes, a scopings review. Uh, his mentor uh, for this study was Dr. Leitman, and uh, it was presented at, uh, as a podium uh, presentation at the AUA in 2021. And it's uh, they're currently in manuscript preparation. So take it away, Danny. Thank you. It's good to see everyone here all together. First time in a couple of years. So um, always good having you, Dr. Weiss, talking with you and Dr. Shulam, welcome back. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Danny Siegel, you guys all know that. Um, today, I'll talk about a study that me and Dr. Lehman and a couple of others of us have worked on. Um, an analysis of ideologic theories proposed to explain racial disparity in prostate cancer outcomes. This was a scoping review that we conducted no financial disclosures. So as a brief overview, um, we'll kind of start off with a brief discussion about prostate cancer outcomes and the racial disparities that are described. Um, and then we'll kind of move on to the methodology of the scoping review that we conducted. We'll talk about the findings that we had and what those conclusions mean and what conclusions can be drawn from those findings. So uh, to start, it's uh, well known that racial disparities exist within prostate cancer with uh, African-Americans being twice as likely to die from prostate cancer due to things like increased incidence and worse outcomes after diagnosis. Many studies have been demonstrated uh, to show you know, these disparities with things like incidence, mortality, overall survival, uh, biochemical recurrence, advanced stage of diagnosis, amongst many others, which aren't even listed here. It's kind of well, well written about in all the literature. And so 
in all of these papers that describe these disparities and any of those outcomes that I just dis uh, discussed, they often will kind of in some form point to something, point to a reason why these disparities happen. A lot of times authors will focus on biologically mediated drivers. We heard about some of that earlier, um, you know, genomics, epigenetics, signaling ba based pathway abnormalities. Um, these are things that have been studied and continue to be studied. Then other authors will kind of point to modifiable structural factors, you know, more, you know, less quantify, less quantitated uh, data, such as like socioeconomic status, access to care, insurance, screening patterns, behavioral or cultural factors, um, and what treatments are offered and, and accepted by patients. Um, and then in some instances, authors will kind of point to both. You know, a lot of times they'll say, well, it's a combination and people don't really want to put their foot down one way or the other. So knowing this, we kind of set out to uh, conduct a scoping review uh, to comprehensively assess the factors to which racial disparity in prostate cancer outcomes have been attributed in the literature. Secondly, we also wanted to see if there were temporal trends in how the authors over time have attributed these factors. So as a scoping review, which is just a large systemic review, almost like a narrative review, meta-analysis, we followed the PRISMA systematic review guidelines. We registered our protocol beforehand, um, and we screened multiple databases to find studies that reported on racial disparity in relation to any prostate cancer outcome. We only included observational studies, and the authors had to make a mention of a biologic or structural factor, which they you know, attributed their observed disparity to. We had two independent screeners review all of the abstracts that were kind of finalized and any disputes were settled between the two. After the initial screen, there were about 6,300 abstracts to be reviewed. These were all went through and uh, 140 of these abstracts were then selected for full text review. Finally, out of those 140, 70 studies were included in review for the final um, analysis. Of these studies, they're from multiple different types of databases. The predominant one would be institutional cohorts. Um, a lot of studies also came from the SEER database. And then there was a variation um, in the remainder of the studies, whether they were state cancer registries, uh, VA health system, NCDB, even one study from the nation inpatient sample. In assessing how many times the authors mentioned or attributed their findings to either a structural or biologic factor within each manuscript, we found that on average, in each manuscript, a structural factor was mentioned about two and a half times, or in a biologic factor, it was 1.96 times. What does this number mean? Overall, not much. There's not much of a difference if you think about an on manuscript difference from paper to paper. But we then kind of went into it a little bit more, and we wanted to see, well, what, in all of these papers that we analyzed, what was the predominant etiologic theory that authors used to kind of explain the dis disparity that was found in whatever outcome they had? And so looking through the papers, we saw which predominant factor, we kind of classified each paper based on that. And so 20% of the papers predominantly attributed their outcomes to a biologic factor alone, 20, 40% to structural factors predominantly, and then 40% attributed to a combination of both. Then we kind of moved on to look at the temporal trend, trends, you know, over time, we broke down all the papers that we had collected um, into a pre-2000 group, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020, to see if the way authors were writing about their, their outcomes and their findings had changed over time. And um, basically as time progressed, more and more they were talking about the structural factors or a combination of factors, which is kind of in line with what we know, you know, the growing recognition that there is an increased impact of structural drivers on these outcomes that we see. And so what do we draw from this information? What is the important take home? Um, basically, our, our aim is never to go out and tell you or tell the readers what the answer is. You know, that's something that may never be answered, but there's still tons of research that goes into it. It's more so to point out how we write about our findings and how important that is. Um, we as authors have to realize that our reportings and our descriptors of th these disparities have impacts on research priorities moving forward and public policy. Um, and so it's, it's obviously something that we as a field need to really think about as we continue writing. If we move forward, for example, towards only prioritizing those biologic factors, you know, the, um, the genomics side of it, let's say, and only focusing on that, well, that can lead to more of a reactive change in our field. You know, this is things like if you think about um, 
if you think about like the AUA guideline discussions that were had about uh, whether African Americans were, should even be eligible for active surveillance, you know, that's a reactive change that would be made to try to change a disparity that has already happened. Um, whereas if maybe we also include these structural factors more and more as we seem to have been doing, then we can, you know, talk about how to prevent these changes before they happen moving forward. You know, stopping the disparity, you know, by altering access, physician patient trust, treatment modalities and things like that. And so I, I kind of went through the literature a little bit to see how other authors were talking about this topic because it's kind of come up more and more recently. And this is a very recent publication, um, the EAU called Deconstructing, Addressing and Eliminating Racial and Ethnic Inequities in Prostate Cancer Care. And um, they provide a framework for discussion and research surrounding the, these disparities where you know, you have to, we, have, we as a field have to recognize all of these factors together, the structural factors, social factors, and health factors. And then research needs to be divvied up into each one of these categories so that we know where to try to limit and narrow the gap. And so uh, that's basically it. So I just want to say thank you again. It's uh, great to have everyone together and uh, I'll ask any questions, answer any questions. Thanks. Hopefully we can get us back on schedule here with this. Um, thank you for this. Um, today I'm going to talk about introducing concepts of data science and machine learning in prostate cancer. And keep in mind, this is a particular experience at Yale. Um, I think it's kind of nice that we're almost going full circle back to Dr. Weist with his background in mathematics. And now we're bringing these back into our analysis of prostate cancer and hopefully see how this can change clinical decision making. So I want to start by just taking a brief overview of the prostate cancer diagnostic workflow. And again, this is unique to Yale. This is an engineer's view of prostate cancer diagnosis. So the patient comes in with some elevated level of PSA. They get referred to an MRI. A radiologist will then look for lesions. If any are found, they're given a score. And if any are found, then they eventually go see a urologist. And if not, they also go see the urologist for prostate cancer biopsy for a systematic biopsy, which then gets sent to pathology for basically your gold standard diagnosis, which is pathological review of these needle biopsies. Some of them will have genetic testing, but this ultimately determines your course of treatment. So while I have my fingers kind of in this entire like workflow, today I decided to focus on this one component. And this was to see if we could actually avoid or address this problem of avoiding overdiagnosis of insignificant cancer. And by insignificant cancer, I mean like Gleason grade group one or any of the negative findings that are found. And this is the benefit of reducing biopsies. And with machine learning, you can actually reduce this number by 38%. You can avoid 38% of biopsies while only missing about 3.6% of clinically significant cancer. So if you listen closely, you can probably hear the pathologist across the street saying, yay, we have a little bit less work to do to read these biopsies. But maybe you also hear the concerns of some patients that you might be missing some clinical significant cancer. So it's just some things to keep in mind when you're trying to like reduce these biopsies. So I'll start with just an example that we found recently from literature. Um, this was a way, a kind of heuristic approach to trying to see if you could avoid some biopsies. And what this group did, this was published about four months ago, was to stratify these groups uh, based on uh, PSA density. And what they did was they proposed a few strategies. And these strategies had a bunch of rules. You can see they recommended this out of 10 strategies that they proposed, strategy number seven was able to reduce 41% of the biopsies, but had a pretty high miss rate on that clinically significant cancer. Another one, a little bit more conservative approach was something that you could avoid 27% of those biopsies and only miss about 4%. But I have a few problems with this because these PSA groups, they're, while they're defined from the literature, they're somewhat arbitrarily defined and they don't really reflect like a, a personalized view of medicine here for reflecting each patient's individuality. 
And they're really a bunch of like handcrafted heuristic rules that come along with these strategies. And if you ask like one of my students, the one who is primarily doing this work, she can come up with slice and dice this data and she can get you something that's saving like practically 7% of the bi 70% of the biopsies, but at like a rate of about five and a half percent miss rate. So you can go all over the place, but will that also generalize? That's a big question. Um, the other thing is this ignores a whole host of additional clinical features that may be relevant to each person. So again, personalized medicine, can we do better? In comes machine learning. Maybe we can learn something, have a machine tell us a more optimal strategy. So how does this differ from a classical programming approach? So to kind of give you this, this like overview here, in the classical sense is you have a bunch of rules already defined and you have your data. Well, you define the algorithm and then you get your answers out. But in machine learning, you provide the data, you provide the answers, and the computer algorithm will tell you the rules that come out of this. So to uh, kind of give this in a practical sense here in prostate cancer, pyrides itself is like that classical programming approach, okay? So radiologists have a set of rules and out comes some form of an answer. It's basically like a probability of how, whether you're gonna find clinically significant cancer or not, okay? Think of it on that scale of one to five. Whereas in machine learning, we take prior data that has these labels, you know, the ground truth that came from pathology, and the machine, the computer algorithm, will tell us the rules, how to get that back out. So I'm gonna illustrate how we applied that to specific Yale cohort of data. Now this was acquired over about two years of prostate cancer biopsy data. And it enrolled, it started with about almost 2000 visits. And from that, we took about 1200 patients. And what you can see on the left is a histogram of what that data looks like. What you can kind of tell is that there is a lot of like clinically insignificant cancer in this. And that's stratified across all these PIRADS groups, which tells you that PIRADS and radiological assessment of prostate cancer is very challenging to do. But it also means that we biopsy a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of the prostate that we might not have to do. So in comes PIRADS as an example of classical um, programming here. This is a radiological view of assessing prostate cancer. And you can compute like the uh, receiver operating characteristic curve from this. If you take those values of pyrides of some form of your guess of it predicting clinically significant cancer. So I'm going to illustrate a few points. What we want to do is we want to find a rule like we saw before with those strategies that can say how can we miss clinically insignificant cancer. And you wanna kind of be up here on this curve. So this illustrates a rule where you're basically taking your PIRAD scores and you say, I'm only gonna biopsy PIRADs fours and fives. I'm gonna say those are gonna be clinically significant cancer. And that gives you this point on this AUC curve. And at this, this point in this curve, you avoid taking about 34% of these biopsies while missing 3.7% of clinically significant cancer. A more conservative approach here is you draw that line back down so you biopsy everything pyrides three, four, and five, ignore anything less. And you only miss about 1.1% of clinically significant cancer. So overall, how do these two compare? I put a little asterisk next to the bottom one, that, that orange triangle because this is what we actually discovered. And this was probably one of the most interesting things that happened here at Yale was through the, tum the Artemis tumor boards that we had, um, this question was asked, can we stop biopsying pyrads two and below? And during this one hour meeting that we had, uh, we actually took a look at the data. I was sitting offline. This is right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I ran the numbers very quickly in this database that we had compiled. Um, and I came up with this answer said, oh, we'd only miss 1.1% of cancer. And that was very rewarding because it actually put into practice. And now radiologists here at Yale are no longer even identifying PIRADS 1 and 2 because of this. But the problem is there weren't many of those detected anyway from the beginning. They already weren't doing much. So that's not actually too impactful. But it was actually a pretty rewarding experience that data science had a practical clinical impact at Yale. So machine learning, 
what's the data that we can use and make use of that might go above and beyond what you saw in the previous approach? And how can we tailor this prediction of which biopsies would be necessary or not? So this is kind of the kitchen sink approach, taking this really rich database that's been collected over years here at Yale. And again, this is probably the most important part of data science is this data collection process. This took years and years of collecting the data and making sure that it was in a nice format. The analysis here probably took about two weeks to do, but we threw various um, factors here, various clinical data that we had available from this database in some way, again, to tailor this more to specific patients. So age, PSA, PSA density, the gland volume itself, the lesion volume and the pyrad score. And what we did is we threw this into a decision tree this is a really nice, easy form of machine learning. And it's really nice because it basically provides a bunch of split points. What you can see, this graphically represents an example decision tree where orange, orange blocks represent not significant cancer, blue ones represent clinically significant cancer. And if you look at the top of each of those little nodes, you see one of those data values, those input features, you choose a split point and then it partitions the data. What's really nice about this one in particular compared to some other machine learning approaches is that it's somewhat interpretable. I can provide you this picture and you can see what the model is doing. Um, it gets more complex because this is only a very small tree. Can you imagine doing this with something with hundreds of nodes? But this decision trees have been a very easy thing to do and shown to be extremely effective with um, data samples that are fairly small, just like with this, and then about 1,200. If you throw a bunch of trees together, you get what's called a random forest. So a forest collection of trees, and each one of these are randomly generated split points. So you get a different answer, but the power is in the statistics. You average over your final results and you actually get a more powerful result. So this is what we leverage here in this study. And what the result is, after performing a tenfold cross-validation study, we get a ROC curve that looks like this. So we went from the previous result that had an AUC of something around 75 to an AUC that's now 82 plus or minus uh, 0.02 in your standard deviations. And this was using all those six features. And here I've chosen three possible points on this curve and what the various like trade-off is in terms of the number of biopsies avoided, the percentage of that versus the um, numbers of clinically significant cancer missed. And I chose values that were similar to those previous studies. Uh, I just want to caution that you can't really compare the two groups between that PSA density group and the bottom two pyrids and reinforced because they're two different data sets. But you can see in our data, I chose the first point in blue really corresponds to something that had 4% miss rate. And that was something similar to what that previous study had done in their conservative approach, uh, strategy number 10. And whereas their approach missed or avoided 27% of biopsies, this machine learning approach was able to get closer to 40% missing. So you could avoid almost 40% of these biopsies while only missing 4% of clinically significant cancer. And I also tried so the a comparison that was closer with about 3.6% miss rate, which compares to that PIRADS four or greater. And it achieved a smaller increase in avoiding biopsies, but you're still close to 40% that way. And uh, the final one is that orange circle, which is if you wanna be really conservative and just miss the 1.1, well, that compares almost similar to the PIRADS other strategy. But what are we missing? They give you different answers. So this, this is an illustration of what a machine learning decision rule, how it compares to something like the radiologist rule. So if you look at what was missed by, say, the decision from the PIRADS strategy there, it's a really, consider that a linear decision. You're basically chopping off at PIRADS four and five, so you're never missing any biopsies there. But look what you're missing. You're missing all those uh, ones, twos, and threes. In contrast, the machine learning approach is not that easy to kind of interpret, but it's this highly nonlinear decision rule. But what it, it, what it does allow, and what you can see in this figure, is that 
a bunch of pyrads fours and even some fives in that insignificant cancer would be avoided by this approach. So they're actually telling you that they're not biopsying, you would, would avoid biopsying different radiology assigned things that you can biopsy. So these initial results are very interesting because it shows that machine learning does have the potential to provide this data-driven approach to personalized cancer, um, prostate cancer care. And it's interesting because you could incorporate this into your decision-making process. And it is possible that you could even make this a shared decision process where you involve the patient in that too. Say, oh, hey, this model is gonna say that maybe we shouldn't biopsy this lesion at all because it's more similar to all these other people where there wasn't found at all. So um, it's a chance to avoid some biopsy, save some money, save the patient maybe some uh, pain and uh, save some resources really. But I do want to caution that these results are specific to Yale. But one of the things that's interesting is be, that I think that the radiologists are actually pretty good at their PIRADS scoring. And that's a pretty strong um, input variable to this model. How well this generalizes to other sites is a big question. So I have to take this with a grain of salt. Um, but in the future, what we're really looking to do is include other information about this, such as where the lesions are with respect to the whole gland. I think that's probably an actual very um, useful feature because if you can't even get to the gland or if it's a challenging spot to biopsy, that can be reflected in this approach. And there's also all the non-invasive imaging data that hasn't been made use of yet in this algorithm. And we can incorporate that into this prediction process. And I really would like to thank the support of the entire like Yale interdisciplinary prostate program because this work is really the culmination of all the efforts in that for the previous years. And um, you know, all the efforts that go into this can be incorporated into these machine learning frameworks at all points within that diagnostic workflow of prostate cancer. So to conclude, I wanna pose a question to you. What is your tolerance for risk here on this kind of curve? And do you trust something like this black box approach machine learning to make these kind of decisions? So thank you and for your time and happy to take any questions. Yeah, I think one of the beauties is you can incorporate more and more data. As you incorporate more data points, different kinds of features that might give complementary information to what's already there. And the potential is that that gives even more specific personalization and stratification of this process. The biggest challenge is the integration of that data and getting that data points into the algorithm. I mean, really the, again, 80, 90% of any data science machine learning project is data pre-processing and data cleaning. <laughs> so just integrating all those clinical resources into something that's meaningful is the big challenge. And so it looks like the curve would dictate that percentage. And so to, what we really want to do is be getting enough data to change our AUC so it's higher. And that'll that'll then give us this narrow window. It's just interesting because when, when you create this curve and then you just move along this curve, exactly. you take this 10% value and say, so what do we want? We want one. Yeah. Multiply by 10, it's going to take that percentage away. You know what I'm saying? So it seems like looking at the curve is one but we want to look at a series of curves with different data sets to give us different AUCs to give us different ratios and we'll change our percentages. Correct. Yeah. A lot of it goes into what is what your level of risk is. You would choose one of these different points. Clearly, as we get better and better algorithms, if we do more data, that curve goes up to that upper left corner. That's what we want. What we really want is to be on that top and have it as flat as possible at the top to have your highest true positive rate as possible. 
um, and just head that direction. So my, my, what I think is I would be driving to change the AUC rather than determining where I want to move further. And once you feel that you top out at AUC from where we are with data available today, then we determine where we want to go. Right. But what's really nice is you create that curve and then you get to pick that point. <laughs> yeah. John, could you imagine a scenario where you actually incorporate rather than just what the output, the risk of clinically significant prostate cancer, the risk of, you know, gen uh, benefits from treatment or the risk of dying of prostate cancer? Like Correct. Taking into account comorbidity, age, things like that. You just change that black box, what goes into that. So instead of your answer is going in being that binary clinically significant cancer or not, you actually do like survival time or something. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. All right, so uh, the next speaker is Dr. Frankel. Uh, title is The Coming Era on the Relation for Prostate Cancer. All right. So I will try to move along quickly here. This is a lot to talk about, but 10 minutes, we'll see if I can. Be quick. First of all, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Thank you, Dr. Shulin, for being here. Um, this is uh, going to talk about prostate cancer ablation and sort of my tagline is the best option for your intermediate risk cancer patients. It's a little provocative, I realize, but I want to take these few minutes to really make the case for why prostate cancer ablation is very different now than what you may have heard about it even five years ago. Um, so I have several disclosures. The only relevant one is that I'm on a clinical advisory board for Profound Medical, which makes the Tulsa Pro uh, ablation device. Um, so what patients want? So we, Dr. Leitman gave a great talk about this sort of not even what they want, but how they interpret data is very important. So there is a significant increase in medical consumerism. In a recent Press Ganey study from 2021, just last year, 2.2 times more patients in last year than the year before are using online resources to select their physician and to select their treatment. So two times more. So that's twice as many. It's, it's really incredible how much uh, consumerism in healthcare is, is changing and is, is appreciating. Um, They're actively involved in their care decisions. And as Dr. Lee mentioned, some of them are interested in new technology, some may not be, but I think predominantly, especially in New England, most of our patients want to be in charge of their care and are interested in their decision making. And they want new technologies. They don't want to go with the status quo. They're ready to sort of break the, break the, um, break the screen and, and try something new. I think we can all agree that ideal cancer management would be complete eradication of cancer without any side effects. That would be great doesn't happen. So let's be a little more practical and realize that for prostate cancer specifically, we really want to try to avoid morbidity, morbidity and mortality from the cancer while minimizing the side effects of treatment. We realize that this is often a trade-off. So we can't always get everything that we want. And um, based on our risk category for prostate cancer, we treat it differently. So the intensity of therapy really correlates with the grade of cancer. Low risk patients, as has already been addressed, we treat them with active surveillance. They can avoid treatment. We know that that is safe. Intermediate risk, many of these men are candidates for treatment, while as with high risk patients, really need escalation and multimodal therapy. We're going to focus on intermediate risk prostate cancer patients because those are really the candidates for focal ablation therapy. So who are these intermediate risk patients? Well, they're actually pretty common. About 27% of the biopsies that we do come back with intermediate risk prostate cancer, so almost a quarter of patients. If we look at the patients who have a positive prostate biopsy or diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's about 44% of those. So a quick little back of the envelope, that's about 110,000 men per year are diagnosed with intermediate risk prostate cancer, and they're gonna have to weigh those impacts, cancer control versus side effects, which is gonna be most effective for them? Well. We unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for prostate cancer patients, what makes our decision making more difficult is there does not appear to be a clear benefit to treatment for most men or pretty much all men within 10 years of treatment. So especially in intermediate risk of disease and low risk disease, looking at the PIVOT trial, which followed men between randomized between surgery or observation, there was no survival benefit in treatment over observation within 15 years. And then the PROTECT trial, um, which randomized men to surgery, radiation, or active monitoring, there was no prostate cancer mortality survival, but there was a slight um, failure 
free progression survival with, uh, with treatment. So because of this, without there being significant benefit in survival within this 10 year time frame, it makes it really more incumbent upon us to try to minimize the side effects of the treatments, what we are exposing our patients to, what are these toxicities? We know about these toxicities, we see them all the time. Um, in the PROTECT trial, looking at the quality of life side of the follow-up, definitely see higher rates of urinary incontinence, men need to wear pads, higher rates of impotence with treatment, higher rates of rectal toxicity and nocturia with men who receive radiation therapy. Looking at other big, larger population day studies, not just at the expected side effects, but at complications from treatment, men who receive radiation, surgery, or even the combination of both have a significant increase in their complications over time after these treatments. So we are not really doing our patients favors with these treatments currently. Doing, looking at a large meta-analysis and review of regret after prostate cancer treatment. The main drivers of regret were quality of life side effects such as impact on sexual function and impact on urinary function. Now, I realize we can look at that data and we can say, oh, well, you know, I'm a good surgeon. I don't necessarily have those same numbers. Well, unfortunately, Lake Wobegon is fictitious. Not all urologists at Yale can be above average. Okay, so I took that from James Yu. He really liked that. Man. But, uh, but we're, we're good. But even our patients, when we do really good surgery, have these side effects. So we recognize there are these significant side effects. Can we do better? Yes, we can. We do that by modifying our surgical technique, different surgical approaches. We add rectal spacers to radiation. So yes, we're making small incremental improvements, but I think we need to take a step back and look um, at other major things that have influenced our treatment for prostate cancer recently. So I have to thank Dr. Shulam who started me on the MR fusion biopsy program, helped had me start it or put me in place to start it, <laughs> forced me to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, I still know, I want to be a general urologic pathologist. I don't want to focus on any particular one. I still Peter is focused on No, I remember. <laughs> Things change. Things change. As Dr. Weiss mentioned, too, as you start finding your target, it's you got to hone in on it a little bit. Um, it's like the way they said, if your patient is sort of this thing, then this whole moment you start not have I can't understand how people can think of it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's incredible. Um, my, my kids aren't there yet. But, uh, but MRI and targeted biopsy has really revolutionized our ability to manage prostate cancer. So we can localize the prostate cancer now and we more accurately grade and stage it. We know what we're dealing with, which allows us to know where in the prostate the cancer is, how big it is, what is its orientation compared to vital structures such as the neurovascular bundle, the urethra, and really small lesions do not need big treatments, right? You're not going to come at this little apple with a wrecking ball. We need something a little more focused. There is damage, the surrounding structures is problematic. So taking a step back, what are some of the premises of focal ablation, right? So that's why we need to be precise, but there are other important things about prostate cancer. So Gleason 6 prostate cancer is not lethal, does not need to be treated. MRI can reliably identify the clinically significant disease within the prostate, so MR and targeted biopsy, which improves our risk stratification of disease. Index lesions, so that's sort of the main cancer. That's about, in about 85% of prostate cancer patients, there is an index lesion. There is one area of cancer that is clinically significant, and by treating that, you can eradicate the, the concerning disease within the prostate. So really, we can reliably detect biopsy and destroy many of the clinically significant prostate cancers that exist. Now, focal therapy, um, it's not new. We do it for lots of other uh, organs. It is precise and anatomic. We can identify specifically where we want to treat. There are fewer side effects because of this. We can spare the vital structures like the urethra, the neurovascular bundles, and even better for patients, it's a one-day outpatient procedure. They go home the same day, not like the same day after prostatecting with the air for their 14 hours. This is literally their in procedure for a couple hours. They go home a couple hours later. So let's look at some of the data quickly. This is where um, I'm not going to show a lot of studies because uh, I'm just going to look at comparative studies of traditional therapies such as prostatectomy, radiation, and focal therapy. So an initial study with about a 36-month median follow-up, it's a paired match study of men who had radical prostatectomy or HIFU, uh, 55 men in each group. 
the definition of failure is important to recognize. So this was treatment failure was salvage hormonal therapy, metastasis, or a positive biopsy in the treatment area. Oncologic outcomes were the same. So you can see salvage-free survival was roughly the, was the same. Cancer-specific survival was the same. Overall survival was not statistically different. So similar oncologic outcomes with 36-month mean, but 60-month long-term uh, follow-up. In terms of functional outcomes, significantly better for the focal high food group. So continence was better at all time points. Potency was better at all time points from immediately after treatment through up to two years of follow-up. So looking further at other oncologic follow-up uh, studies, um, this was a study that evaluated focal therapies, including high food, cryo, and focal brachytherapy compared to standard whole gland therapies such as prostatectomy or radiation therapy. There was no statistically significant difference, statistically significant difference in terms of uh, failure-free survival. So that's sort of over here. Again, the failure-free survival is salvage therapies um, or overall survival. If you break it down by different types of treatment, so red is radiation therapy, green is focal therapy, blue is prostatectomy, the time to failure was not statistically different between those groups, but you can see the curves diverge some. Um, with a, a six-year follow-up, and the overall survival was not clinically different. There were some statistical variations, but that's likely related to the data in the population. Um, and radiation did worse, focal therapy did best, so you kind of have to question some underlying bias in the patient population there. Um, finally, looking at one other study, that comparing this looked at focal HIFU uh, or cryo uh, in unfavorable intermediate risk disease or less, comparing to surgery. And again, the primary outcome was failure-free survival. In this group that looked at almost 1,300 patients, did propensity weighted matching to two groups of 250 patients, which were very well matched after propensity matching. With almost 10 years of follow-up, there was no difference in the time to salvage for systemic therapy and no difference in the rate of mortastasis or mortality. So very good long-term clinical oncologic outcomes are similar. But at the bottom, erectile function was almost twice as many people had erectile function in the focal therapy group than the prostatectomy group. And the PAD3 continence rate was also significantly higher in the focal therapy group compared to the prostatectomy group. So what are the side effects of these focal therapies? A very recent study um, looked at more recent, sort of 2021 of the complications. <laughs> list here, uh, infectious complications, hematuria, acute urinary retention, sloughing, urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction. While all of these things can occur, they're at much, much lower rates than we associate with any of the radical therapies where we're treating the entire prostate. So let's go back to our consumer. So even you could put yourself in the place of a consumer. What would you want for you or your patients? A comparable cancer control with excellent functional outcomes after a single day outpatient procedure? That seems like a pretty good sale to me. So I can understand why there are a lot of patients that are interested in this. There are obviously lots of details, but I think that this is definitely a growing and very important thing for us to be considering. So all the previous guidelines, previous recommendations, focal therapy, you know, needs to be done very closely monitored way. That was done based on um, data through 2017, studies published in 2015. We can look at the amount of data. So upper left, these are studies and patients. Between the previous 20 years, so 1996 to 2015, there were 37 publications. In the last five years, 2015 to 2020, there were doubled, 72 publications. Uh, similarly, number of patients almost doubled. This bottom right graph is looking at the types of prostate cancers being treated. More recently, we have shifted to intermediate risk prostate cancer. No longer are we trying to say, okay, this is not dangerous. We can do this as an alternative to active surveillance. We know that active surveillance works best for low-grade patients. Really, the target for focal therapy is intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. We can have similar cancer control to definitive therapy with many fewer side effects. Um, I think, you know, we're beginning to see this uptrend that we saw with robotics. Robotics began in the early 2000s and really took off, and it ran really ahead of the data to show that it was better. I do have to commend the other uh, researchers in focal therapy. They're trying to be much more judicious with how we are using the data to support the progress, um, but this is uh, really coming. So 
the recommendations to perform these studies as part of a registry of trial still exists. And I think it's appropriate, but fortunately for all of you and us here at Yale, we have trials and registries. Um, we have two clinical trials that are currently active uh, with the Tulsa program. Um, both of them are for whole gland prostate treatment as part of the trials, the TAC trial and the Kaplan trial, which is a randomized prostatectomy versus Tulsa, uh, following up oncologic and um, quality of life outcomes. Our ablation registry has been active since 2015. We have more than 50 patients, 20 of which were within the last year. So our numbers are also ramping up significantly. This includes cryoablation, irreversible electroporation, and uh, subtotal Tulsa ablations. Um, and we also have several trials that we will be kicking off. One is in focal laser ablation using AI-assisted targeting, uh, as well as an upcoming HIFU trial. So take-home points, I realize we're rushing through this, but uh, there's a lot I didn't, didn't even talk about. Um, but patients are increasingly our consumers of healthcare, and they want the cancer control, and they want it without side effects. Um, I think focal ablation, which does have this excellent cancer control that is comparable, comparable to radical therapy um, and simply fewer side effects than radical treatment, is that answer. It is an appropriate balance of cancer control and preserving quality of life uh, for our intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. So, and again, it's available at Yale. So embrace the future. If you are interested in doing these treatments, I'm very happy to include anyone who wants to do them. I think we, we have a great team. We have the infrastructure for performing these procedures. We have the database, the registry, the protocols. Um, so, you know, this is available for your patients. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Or not. So I think they are all exciting and they have their different roles. So that, that graphic that I sort of had a briefly had information about high food, um, you know, where the cancer is in the prostate, the size of the cancer, and um, those all come into what type of treatment modality should be used. So I don't think there's one that's going to be the best. I think there are gonna be different ones that are better for different parts of the cancer. They all have their sort of strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'm gonna doing a much longer 45 minute grand rounds in June where I'm gonna probably go over all of that in a little bit more detail. I would say there's not one, uh, they each had a limitation. I don't think anyone could have one, one technology and consider that to be adequate for all patients that are gonna come in requesting that kind of therapy. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Benjamin Press. Ben Press, he's one of our PGY3 residents. Uh, his interests include pediatrics and uh, uh, academic oncology, urological oncology. And he took that breath of uh, conditions and he chose to do research on uh, selective laser enucleation of the prostate, preserving sexual function without compromising urinary outcomes. So um, this uh, study that he's gonna present uh, has been submitted with revisions and is waiting a final decision for publication. Uh, come on, Ben, take it away. Uh, yeah, now for something uh, completely different. Um, so we'll also be presenting this uh, at the AUA uh, in, in New Orleans. All right, so uh, HOLEP uh, is a size independent surgical option for BPH and uh, is becoming a popular alternative to the TERP. Um, you know, the improved functional outcomes after whole up are well documented, but there are some significant side effects, including stress incontinence, irritative lower urinary tract symptoms, and retrograde ejaculation in about 75% of men um, who undergo like a full whole up will have a retrograde ejaculation and the transient stress urinary incontinence rate, you know, range sort of in the literature between sort of 10 and about a third um, kind of permanent stress incontinence, you know, that sort of persists after six months to a year is usually kind of around the 5%. Um, so we sought to evaluate um, outcomes related to sexual function and urinary function um, by doing sort of a modified whole up where we only um, enucleate the median lobe. Um, this has not really been described for whole up. It has been described uh, for TERP. Um, so we did a retrospective review um, of the first 450 cases of whole up uh, by a single self-taught uh, surgeon from April 2019 to March 2022. Um, we had 55 patients who underwent uh, this selective enucleation uh, based on preoperative image, you know, based on preoperative imaging and cystoscopy. So our criteria were it's 
albeit somewhat uh, not exactly completely objective, where they did have to have some sort of intra, you know, intravesical median lobe or high bladder neck or high prosthetic urethral angle, um, and they can't have obstructing lateral lobes. Um, we asked patients to comment on whether they had retrograde ejaculation as well as sort of the volume of ejaculate during their follow-up appointments. Um, we assessed urinary function using AOA symptom scores and uh, quality of life scores, as well as you know, subjective evaluations of urinary incontinence. So here's, a, here's your sample patient. He's a 57-year-old male, med medically refractory LUTs. He's got AOA symptom score 24. His quality of life score is 4. He's on uh, sildosin. Um, he uh, discontinued Flomax because of bother for retrograde ejaculation. He discontinued finasteride because of poor libido and erectile function. He wants, uh, he wants surgery, but he is, you know, ejaculatory function is a concern for him. He wants a Eurolift. He did an ultrasound. He's got a 74 uh, gram prostate. You, you, do a, you do a cystoscopy. You find his anterior urethra is normal. You've got non coapting lateral lobes. If you'll just, everyone turn your head a little bit, you'll see that there is, you know, this patient does have an intravesical median lobe. Um, you know, the FDA does approve, is approved for Eurolift for, um, you know, patients with an intravesical median lobe, but, you know, especially since Juan is here as well, and I hear his, uh, what about the guidelines just reverberating in my head? So when we look at the guideline statements, you know, the Eurolift should only be considered as a treatment option for LUTs and BPH, provided that you have a prostate volume of 30 to 80 cc's and a verified absence of an, of an obstructive median lobe. So let's hope that this video works. So this is kind of what we're talking about. I apologize if the video is fast and choppy. So here we here is our here is our patient. We are now going to see the not really obstructing lateral lobes, but now as we go up here, we continue to climb this large, large median lobe. We're about to push into the bladder. We start similarly to a terp with sort of a releasing incision at five and seven o'clock. Here we start at uh, the seven o'clock position. Um, we carry this we carry this incision down to the capsule. Um, we then also proximally we advance just sort of immediately. Um, me approximal to the viru, right? As you see right here, we sort of cross over to the other side. All right, we're still, all right. And then we will flip over to the other side. Now we're moving to the five o'clock position where we continue this incision down, um, down to the capsule and depth wise, and then proximally to right, immediately or distally pro just proximal to the viru um, where we see we're now connecting with our prior incision. Now we're delivering this median, they're sort of delivering this median lobe very slow and sort of in a, uh, in a retrograde fashion into the bladder. As you see, we're like right on the capsule. Um, it's a little longer than I thought. And then here as we are, we're releasing the final attachments of the median lobe, we now pop the giant meatball into the bladder. And as you can see here, we have a nice wide open channel. We come back to the, the viru and the sphincter. The sphincter is preserved. Nice wide open channel. All right, in case, yeah. So this is sort of, this is a figure from the, our manuscript that's currently under revision. So you see here in the top left, we have a large obstructing lateral lobe, kind of median lobe, sorry, diminutive lateral lobes. We make our initial incision at the bladder neck at the junction of the median lateral lobes. Um, and then here is the view from the sphincter. We have, uh, you know, preservation of tissue around the viru um, and a nice wide open channel. So our median age of these patients is about 65 years. Our median prostate size is about 52 grams. We take about nine grams of tissue, but we've sort of, you can see here, we have a wide range of median lobe sizes. Um, so on our average follow-up about almost four months, about four months now, we have significantly lower PVRs post-operative compared to pre-operatively from 250 down to 70. Um, we have significant improvements in urinary function as, as measured by AUA symptom scores from 20, from 22.5 to 6.9, and our quality of life scores also significantly improved postoperatively compared to preoperatively um, from 4 to 1.2. Um, we had no patients report any stress urinary incontinence after the procedure, um, and we did have three patients that report, did report some urge urinary incontinence after their initial post-op visits. So of these 55 patients who underwent uh, this um, you know, selective implantation of the median lobe. Um, 40 uh, were sexually active with follow-up data available. Of those 40, um, 35 reported normal anti you know, uh, integrated ejaculation. So in conclusion, you know, our case series of, you know, our small series of uh, patients who underwent selective nucleation of the median lobe only 
Um, we still had um, significant improvements in urinary function, and we still managed to um, preserve sexual function in, in men, you know, almost 90% of men. Um, we do understand that it is a small, you know, we do understand the limitations, small sample size. It is somewhat of a curated uh, population, but that's sort of by design. Um, you know, one of the nice advantages as far as compared to a full holop, we do have lower rates of kind of these, you know, urinary side, you know, side effects are associated with holop. We had no stress incontinence, very few uh, dysuria urge related incontinence. Um, you know, this is not, we're not really making any grand proclamations that this is better or worse than any of these other sort of modified procedures. Um, there are just, you know, it, but it is potentially an option. We do need to um, have longer follow up, you know, to determine whether these findings are more durable and to, more, to find more kind of objective criteria. Um, I think that this just shows that, you know, this is a, one of the, one possible option that you can offer a, a group of men who may, you know, who want a more definitive treatment, um, but are, you know, still concerned with uh, some of the sexual side effects of BPH treatment. I think that we're, pres we're preserving sort of the, uh, that tissue right around, the, right around the viewer. I think we're doing a better job of that as opposed to like when you take, a, when you're doing like a terp or a full, like entire full whole life. Do you consider doing this procedure as integrated ejaculation is not a uh, priority of the patient? Um, I think that's something that we would probably look like, sort of look, I think future studies where we would want to compare um, I guess compare the compare the outcomes of those um, who get like a full whole up as opposed to those who just get a medium of. I think that's definitely a future direction. But I'm not. I guess I guess the question is not sure. We'd have to do some investigation first. Again, for me, this, you know, when you're coming up on the capsule, you're getting close to your depending on the size and being below the function of the capsule. Yeah, we always um, use two ureters, and once you guys identify the bladder neck, you place the bladder neck. And the ureters are very close at night, but we just kind of design what we want the patient to provide. Sometimes we take the head, but we kind of like, take the skin off the end of the stick. Just to make sure that you can see. But just again, Ben, as we point out here, um, our patients all go home after the procedure. We don't give pain medication. Um, sometimes we take them when they have to take a bad idea too. So this, this is a this is really great, great uh, answer to the study about this. Yeah, so how do you define uh, not much plus level loss? It's basically based on the content. So it's all based on stuff. So you know, basically, when I first started doing these procedures, I would just run my scope right through the bottom of the inner and look at it. If you really look, you know, you just basically look at the ladder. I spend more time in this process than the ladder, honestly. So what I do is I come back, I park myself in the rear room, and I kind of look back, and I pick out a lot of pressure of water. I can see how low the ladder looks. Is that thing, are they really out of the way? It's pretty obvious that there's a big, big head of load, and sometimes that really takes over effect of pushing the ladder looks out of the way. And then the other thing is, sometimes it's not an obvious wall, but if you come up with a flexible piece of equipment, like kind of an interesting piece of equipment, you need to really flex the seat level. We know it's a height, it's a height in the bar, and also you can use quite a lift effect all this, you can kind of tell it's a step out of an elevator, a hill rope, or kind of bar, you can start to get a feel for it. 